Welcome to Zero Page Homebrew, your best source for the newest Atari games. And we do have a new one tonight, but not only that. We have a very special show. We have a developer spotlight on Andrew Davey. You know him from Boulder Dash, a recent release as of a two days ago, re-release of Boulder Dash. So, but we'll get into that in a second. Uh, welcome to the show. Welcome to Zero Page Homebrew. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at some Atari 2600 games tonight made by Andrew Davey and go back in time a little bit as well nice. through his history, his programming history, and learn a little bit more about this mysterious man. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to thank all the Twitch subscribers who are scrolling down beside Tanya, 8-Bit Poet, Ace3093, Alnifer, Archimage, Ar Armscar, Coder, Atari Denard, XL Rules, Atari 1974, Atari 2600, Dude, Atari H, Beef, Beef Supreme, 07, BR Poco, Buck Owens, Captain 2D, Charles Stone Mount, Charles Willing, Colonel Lama, Cubitismo, Dianoid, Dan, if you see Daryl 1970, Dr. Mook, Has Great Defender, Ground Trooper, Roger Rapper, Johnny WC, Kabumura, Kabuto, Kenzo, Carl G, Ken Jennings, Avedo, Kaveltifer, Lambda Express, Lauren TDZ, Matt, Max, 2069, Marco Yannis, Mark Space, Inc., Metal Atari 1969, uh, Metal Level, Mick Muse, Mike Soul, Mike Littell, Miss Command, MK Smith, Mr. Fix, Nathan Storm, Neo Media, Nostalgic, Old Style, Pack, Ravigi, Kohog, R. Androids, R. Raymond C., RC70, Render Ghost, Repentless, VG, Retro Gamer, Ricardo Pim, Six Sweet, Smitty B. Smoked, Spiceware, Sermiers, Teleprompter, D Train, Welshman, Tiki Dan, KT Post, TM Events, 2600 X, Ken X. We are like two away from me doing something different than that. Yeah. Because I think it's at 72 names now. Oh my goodness. It's too many to read out almost. 72, so. no, 72 subscribers. Yeah. Wow. That's okay. That's impressive. And it's taking the wind out of me right <laughs> at the beginning of the show. I think that's um, fantastic though. It is. But, it's um, great. All the support, but it's a lot like to read. You might need a computer program to read all those off. In 10 times speed 10 or times speed, I think. <laughs> Just barely audible. You know how people watch YouTube channels at like double speed or listen to podcasts at yes. double speed to get through them? We'll have to do something like that. I'm not, not quite sure yet, but uh, we'll have to do something similar to that. I'm just getting uh, the chat up on our tablet here. I'm not ignoring oh the rest of you right now. <laughs> I, uh... Oh, and yeah, and uh, for the interview, if you have questions during the interview, just type in all capital letters, question, <laughs> and then put your question, and we'll Fair be enough. watching um, the chat. Yep. And I think Andrew might be watching the chat good. too, but we'll good be watching stuff. the chat for questions. So we have some mail before we get to Andrew. We've made him wait a little bit, but we're going to make him wait a little <laughs> bit sad longer. Little cat crying over there. Oh yes, he's sad and pathetic. It's very, very sad. Um, so, uh, big news: uh, Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Uh, uh, sorry, Atari Age. I've released a bunch of Atari games into their store. These were the games that were released at PRGE, and now they're available to everyone. They've been put into the store. Yes, perfect. Where would you like to put this? <laughs> um, right here, right, right in front of me. Oh, that's very hard to see from that yeah, distance. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll fix it in a second. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, tons of games. Block, Boulder Dash, right here. Made by the man of the hour. Uh, Gorf Arcade, Grizzards, Load Runner, Uzi the Goo, Slime Quest, uh, Kicks, Raptor, Ruby Q, Stratavox, Vroom, Robin Banks, 2048, Attack of the Petsky Robots, Dragons Havoc, Galaxian, Keystone Coppers, Pac-Man, 40th Anniversary Collection of Pac-Man Collection, uh, 40th Anniversary Edition, uh, Popeye, Sly Boy in Mazeland, Uniwars, oh my god, my wallet, yeah. that's what people are saying, <laughs> and oh my god, the really, really good set it's of games It's a fantastic well. set of games, yeah. Um, so pick your poison <laughs> and uh, figure out which ones you're going to get, some really good 7800 games in there as well. So there's the list down there. In addition to that, uh, Al reached out to me and said, do you want the zero page homebrew the game in the store? Uh, and there it is. Yeah. You can actually <laughs> That's awesome. buy it, you know, legitimately in the store before this. It's really fun, by the it's way. It's a cute, <laughs> it's, it's a, a cute really game. Fun game. And you get to play as the cats. Yes. You get to play as us. Yes. Uh, you get to play as Darcy or Erlen. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's a cute game, and uh, there you go. It comes just with a cartridge and manual. There's no box. Yeah. Um, but there you go. Before you had to like specialty order it, but he decided to put it into the store. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Al. That was really, really uh, nice of you to do that. I didn't know demand was big enough, but I guess it is. <laughs> he knows better than me. Um, 
And this was posted by Batari. This is quite an interesting um, post here. Uh, he talks a lot about some other things that you can read on your own time. Um, uh, quite a long post. It's probably the longest post I've ever seen Batari make. Uh, it is about uh, chips and cartridges and boards. But uh, the really interesting part that's kind of news... Uh, a dual core melody like board is already a reality because um, the rest of the the uh, message was talking about arm chips mm -hmm. in like the uh, uno cart and uh, the harmony uh, cart and he's talking about a brand new board that people will be able to develop for uh, I already have a cartridge board ready and a small run on hand that is based on the RP 2040 the chip from the Pi Pico. It's called the Piccolo board. The chip has 264k of RAM. Oh my god. And normally 2 megabytes, but can go up to 16 megabytes of flash hmm. for a 2600 game. Oh my god. That's, a lot. <laughs> that's an enormous, enormous amount and runs at 133 megahertz. Uh, the best part is the RP2040 is actually very affordable and thus far more suitable for a cartridge board than the expensive STM32F4. These boards and thousands of RP2040 chips are already in my possession. Thousands of these chips, he says, and ready to go as soon as anyone needs them. I have two reels, each with 3,400 RP24 chips. I didn't know what that number meant. I thought it was a, a part number at first. But it's actually 3,400 chips he has. Oh. Should be enough for a lifetime, maybe. Okay. Um, because I believe you should make the cartridge boards first and not try to work backwards from something else. I believe in the economical dual-core RP2040 uh, much more strongly than I could in any expensive single-core arm. So goes on about that. So that's... Cat, <laughs> you're driving me crazy. You are... Uh, very focused on those treats. Yeah. Naughty. <laughs> um, so there you go. Uh, that'll mean a lot more to developers than it does to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's very, very interesting. Um, also, speaking of hardware. Um, yeah, I'll just play it like that. Correct. The D-Train. Very bad kitty. Bad kitty. He is very naughty right now. Um, Saint uh, from RetroHQ posted this video. Uh, recently, let's just skip ahead, a couple days ago, about his Atari 7800 uh, GD board, mm -hmm. uh, game drive, for the Atari 7800, a multi-cart, and uh, it has crystal clear RGB output, as you can see right there. Let's uh, go to a game here. Kitten? <laughs> a cat. Oh my god, that cat. <laughs> so let's actually go to a bigger screen of that. There we go. So this is actual output from an Atari 7800 because it has RGB output right on the cart. Mm. Um, it has full classic 7800 compatibility plus homebrew support with dual pokey, a YM chip, and BUP audio uh, emulation, which uh, means Ricky and Vicky is supported. There we go. There's Ricky and Vicky looking super crisp. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has Classics 2600 support um, on the cart, but it doesn't have any DPC Plus or CDFJ, and he doesn't think he's going to support that. So really not... I mean, it's more for a 7800 uh, uh, console, not 2600. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be an injection molded cart shell. So it's not 3D printed, and he's aiming for a Q1 release. Uh, so very, very soon. Cool. Um, so there's some more uh, shots. Rescue and Fractilis. Um, there's an example of 2600. So it's a very uh, good way to get really high quality out of your 7800 without even opening up the shell of the console, um, because it has it externally on the cart. Mm. Um, so really really cool i think um so he hasn't announced price yet but i know he initially posted would you be interested in a cart around the 75 us dollar mm. mark um so who knows what that's developed into 
Um, also, I was recently interviewed a couple days ago mm -hmm. about my broadcasting career, uh, which started in 1999 and is still going because you guys are watching this right now. <laughs> um, so there you go. I didn't type any of this up. He said, <laughs> streaming pioneer, filmmaker, crowdfunding inaugurate, Atari homebrew evangelist. <laughs> there we that's, go. That's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. and, and lead vocals because I do sing as well. Um, so you can listen to that. It's Kitten. What are, what is He's doing destroying the set. Um, so you can listen to that. It's about an hour and a half. Um, if anybody wants to hear more about my history before Zero Page Homebrew. Yeah, and I started listening to it on my drive home today. And it wasn't so... complete, uh, completely embarrassing? Uh, no, not completely. <laughs> just, a li <laughs> just a little embarrassing. No, no, it was very yeah. interesting. I learned a lot. Oh, good. I haven't listened to all of it, but... Uh, yeah. I don't tell her anything. So <laughs> no. She has to learn like, all about sorry, me you through a podcast. You radio back in 1990. did what? I didn't what? ever knew that. That's crazy. No. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> but uh, that is all the news that we have for now. Um, but we're now we're going to go to yeah. the man of the hour. Everybody knows him. He's very uh, prominent in the Atari Age forums. He has done big name games like Boulder Dash. Um, yeah. I'd love to welcome to the show. Uh, if he's ready, um, the uh, wonderful Andrew Davey. I was finally able to drag him onto the show. Welcome, Andrew, to Zero Page Homebrew. Thank you. Yes, hello. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And Tanya and James, you feel like old friends, actually. Even though you haven't <laughs> That's much. good. But I've watched you a fair bit, so... Uh, and that's right. And we've support. played your games a fair bit as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you on behalf of the developers for the support you give everyone and the, the very uh, gentle way you treat the newcomers to the scene and your uh, respectful reviews of, of the games. I think it's a great service to the community. Oh, thank you so much for those kind words, yeah. Andrew. We love to, we love to just see development for uh, all these consoles, anybody who's making a game, mm -hmm. putting in the effort, it's it's hard to make a game. So anybody who even tries to make a game, we, we love to celebrate that and to give them encouragement, no matter if it's a beginner level do, using Batari Basic or an expert like you <laughs> <laughs> cranking out just uh, amazing, um, innovative... 2600 games I like, um I like everybody is a uh, place for everyone uh there's you know even the simplest of simple games are hard to write and uh fun to play yeah. so you know i like to um push the envelope and see yeah. what challenges i can uh address uh just like to comment on the uh the news bit up front with the um dual core board from biotari is actually oh yes very interesting because uh, one of the things that um, 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 cartridges have to do is service the requests from the 6502 for uh, bytes from the ROM. So a lot of the processing right. power goes to actually just pretending to be a cartridge. Uh, and it means <laughs> the game has to fit in to the available spare time. So what a dual core does is it lets you spend one of your CPUs pretending to be a cartridge and you can put a whole lot of processing power into mm -hmm. the game. So, for example, we right. have a very complex chess engine running in the background while the ah. has been serviced by the cartridge. So I think it opens up a whole bunch of uh, new capabilities, and I'll be uh, keen to have a look at that. That's right, because normally on a 2600, it spends some time drawing the screen, and then you get to use up the remainder of the non-screen time uh, doing your calculations. And I think that's when it goes and talks to the the ARM chip. But having the dual ARM chip, one is just constantly going in the background. And that's that's incredible. So not only do they have the, say for the chess game, the, the overscan time, but a constant running, even when the person's just staring at the screen, thinking about the next move, it can just keep going deeper and deeper and deeper uh, in terms of, you know, two moves ahead, five moves ahead, ten moves ahead. Yeah, so and, this is... and much more complex display engines too because you don't have to uh, try and build up the frame in, you know, the overscan of vertical blank. You can uh, spend 
all of your city right. uh, building up much more complex uh, uh, displays. So I think it will open the door for games that we haven't seen yet, uh, maybe 3D, 3D games rendered 3D. Yes. That should be feasible. Wow. So be, be because fun. really you can you could build up a frame buffer um, while you're waiting, yeah. especially with that much RAM. Yep. Uh, you can build up multiple frame buffers. Say they choose left instead of right. Yep. You've ha got that calculated already. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's that's really really amazing. Yeah, so that's that is a big a big big deal. And um, hopefully there will be some uh, more development with that, and some of the devs will you know take it on. I'm I'm sure some will be very anxious, especially the uh, CDFJ developers like yourself and uh, um, other ones as well. Um, but let's get into you <laughs> and your history, um, which is quite a, quite a long history, actually. Um, so when did you first play a video game or arcade game? What was the first initial thing that meant that uh, made you go, yes, that's that's what I want to do. That's what I want to get into. So I'm actually very, very old. And my <laughs> first uh, experience with a video game was uh, in an airport uh, arcade machine, which is a car crash, car rally sort of game, black and white. Uh, and um, it was about 1974. And uh, mm -hmm. I spent lots of 10 cent coins on that, waiting for the plane, uh, my school holidays. So I, um, I was amazed that you could uh, control things on a TV set. Uh, on a screen, uh, and that was uh, yeah, pretty uh, addictive. And I didn't think at that time I'd be writing them, uh, but it sort of brought to me the wonder of computers and uh, that you could actually make televisions do stuff with computers. So uh, that was the start. <laughs> yeah, because before that, you just took in television. It was it was broadcast to you. There was no interactivity. It was a one way medium. And I think that's the experience everyone had when they played their first video game. It's like I can change what's on the screen. And that's people don't understand that now, but it it was mind blowing. It was a one way uh, medium before. Mm -hmm. And and just, you know, press like especially th with this game that I'm showing it on the screen right now. Uh, a steering wheel you affected the car <laughs> and and looking at the graphics that for 1974 that is like mind-blowingly unbelievable people think of like yeah, think pong and stuff back then analog mm -hmm. circuitry too in these early games even without mm -hmm. the computer yes. just the idea that you could uh do things was to me an amazing thing and not just on on the screen but that we had access to computers at that time so before 74, you know, the only real access you had to computers was through universities and um, right. a big, big iron, uh, IBM sort of mainframe things. And just around that time was the start of the availability of uh, home computers, uh, maybe a bit high end, but the, you know, the 6502 started around 75, I think. And uh, before that, there were some basic microprocessors uh, the yes, SCMP comes to mind. And so there was a real um, development of interest in bedroom programmers and uh, hobby electronics guys making their own stuff. So it was like just the time when uh, all that started to turn into what we look at now as an industry. Yeah. Um, so your, your history with computers um, and the beginning of taking interest in programming started pretty early. I mean, you told me it was in, in grade seven. Um, I won't say the date, um, <laughs> um, but... Uh, I, I'm happy to share uh, can my you age if you want. I, 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 uh, well, it's 1976, grade seven. You can do the math out there for yourself. Uh, do the homework. Um, the, the, it was, you said it was a timeshare link to a, a PDP-11 or an equivalent kind of thing. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that, like your hands-on, so, first uh, hands-on experiences. My, my, uh, so here we call grades 7 to 10 high school. Uh, so it would be the equivalent of junior high, I think, in the States. Uh, and they had computers available for grades 9 and 10. 
and seven and eight weren't even allowed to go in the same room as the computer. And I was, <laughs> I was fascinated. I just badgered them incessantly. And they started printing out these tutorials uh, from the um, Vista C P2P11 uh, time sharing system, which was really just an uh, introduction to BASIC and how to program in BASIC. And mm. I used to type on my typewriter uh, basic programs. Uh, oh, is that wow. <laughs> and, uh, so I had nothing to run them on. I just, uh, I would format them beautifully and spend hours and hours typing up <laughs> these programs. Uh, and, kind uh, of figuring out in your head what it would actually be doing yeah. if, if it was actually running. Yeah. So uh, eventually they let me start to use the computer. Uh, and so that was really just a time sharing <laughs> terminal. Uh, and the schools all had them. But uh, we had, uh, most of the most of the work we did was on a terminal which had no display, uh, so you oh. go through reams of paper uh, when you, everything you typed was a line on the page, and uh, so that was a big problem we had back then. Uh, how much? Time. Oh right, yes. Yeah, and we used to, of course, print out all the uh, all the Playboy centerfolds in ASCII that we could possibly <laughs> get our hands on. These are all the very low resolution. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, <laughs> but just uh, everything was new and just the idea of using computers and we didn't really know what they were useful for. I mean, kind of, you know, there was simple games like tic-tac-toe and uh, not much more. Right. Um, a few, maybe, I can't even remember, uh, let's say simple adventure games. I think uh, there's a Colossal Cave adventure right. or something like that. Yeah, but, the uh, first text adventure, yeah. Generally, the fun was just making computer do something, anything, and uh, that got me hooked very early on. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, and and you said you also your first um, hands-on experience with a computer at home was a computer that you borrowed from your friend. Yeah. Uh, what was that computer? So this is a um, it's called Ohio Scientific Challenger One P. Uh, this was a a really fun computer. It was a six five zero two base machine. Uh, it had very low resolution character graphics. So I think it was 22 characters across the screen and 12 deep, something very, very low. Uh, and right. this machine was um, made of aluminium. The, the chassis was aluminium and it had a fan oh, okay. that blew through across the, it was a one piece machine. So uh, the motherboard was in the keyboard all together. And it used to blow air across the motherboard to keep it cool. I lived in a really cold place uh, in Tasmania. Uh, so Tasmania is the southernmost part of Australia. And I lived up on, oh, yeah. on a mountain down there. So uh, typical typical day in winter would be, well, cold for Australia, uh, let's say four or five degrees Celsius, which is about 36, 38 Fahrenheit. And this, yeah. this computer blew the air through, from the back of the machine through the keyboard. So you had this very powerful stream of freezing air. Uh, it's like, <laughs> I, Fun. I, I had to wear gloves to use that machine. Uh, I, I, I really want one. My friend has still got that machine. Uh, so I'm hoping wow. uh, that he'll leave it to me in his world. <laughs> you just have to outlive him. That's yeah. all. It, do, <laughs> it does look like it could survive a bomb going off, though. It, that with that aluminum uh, um, case, so it looks very it, sturdy. It, it yeah. may outlive him. <laughs> you never know. Yeah, yeah uh, and, and it, like this, this was a, an interesting choice for me when I got my first computer because I thought that thing was <laughs> ugly. It's like the ugliest computer I've ever seen. And, uh, <laughs> It was not designed with aesthetics in mind. It was purely a functional machine. And uh, yep. I had to kind of, I had three machines to choose from. There's an X30 Sorcerer, which is an 8080 machine, the Challenger, which was very cheap, and the Atari uh, about the time mm -hmm. I was thinking about getting a machine. So, uh, but I pretty right. much decided on 6502 because as you said, James, I borrowed that machine and learned uh, some very early uh, concepts and games programming and uh, sort of self-taught myself 6502 uh, on that machine. Yep. Uh, and well, it was a good chip, chip, good chip to start with. It uh, was widely, widely used in many, many machines. So, well, I, and you said you start, start. There were, okay. there were two in the Hanbrew uh, area that were really the competitors was Z80 
and the yeah. mm -hmm. The 8080 was more a uh, high-end CPM machine, so not really in consideration for those home machines. So I could have right. I could have gone to the dark side. <laughs> you could have, and it'd be a totally different timeline. Yeah. Um, so, uh, what was your uh, first game that you made on? Uh, and do you remember how much RAM was in this computer as well? I think it was four K, something like that. I can't remember. Okay, they, these yeah. things were expandable, so it depends how rich you were. Uh, and mem right. memory was like incredibly expensive. You'd pay several thousand dollars for a couple of K of RAM. So, uh, you know, you, right. it's not like today you just max out the machine and go, you know, it's just RAM. <laughs> like RAM is more expensive yeah. than the machine itself almost. Mm -hmm. so first, oh. First, oh, yeah. First game was on that machine. Uh, it was a clone of Asteroids. Uh, it was only a character graphics machine and it had a, a pre defined character set. So it had like, 256 characters with tanks with eight rotations and um, so my friend and I worked on this together uh, and it was a asteroids clone and so right. it was in a 10 by 10 character grid and we used capital, oh. capital O for the big asteroids <laughs> lowercase O for the little asteroids and the full stop yeah. for the smaller ones so uh, and you could just uh, and I think we used I uh, can't remember one of the tanks maybe uh, for the ship and so you could sort of clunk around on that 10 by 10 grid and turn in the uh, eight directions and fire and it was fun i mean it, it was like by today's standards you guys terrible but like we had our own game at home and uh it was a bit slow because it was written in basic and that was the trigger for learning assembler learning machine code because it right. sped things up a lot uh and it, <laughs> it, oh yeah it made the difference between something that was maybe running at uh, one frame per second to a hundred frames per second, uh, so that, big jump. Yeah. Uh, so, so you saw the uh, the advantage of of learning assembly quite quickly, and and you said your next game was uh, something similar to like uh, the Star Trek um, text slash graphical based uh, game. So I just uh, correct you on one thing. Uh, there's a difference between yeah. assembly and machine code. So uh, the, oh. uh, when you type in uh, an opcode like uh, increment X, I and X, uh, yeah. uh, that's assembly. But machine code is where you actually enter the number that that represents. Uh, so this, this work was done in machine code because uh, we, <laughs> we did not have an assembler at that point. Uh, so oh, geez. That was a great introduction to understanding the microprocessor to uh, wow. a much greater extent than you probably would today. So the yeah. start, actually, uh, not by me. It was uh, another friend who had an Exidy saucer, which is the Z80 machine. And um, that one, uh, he had also written an assembler and uh, very, very tempting to get an Exidy. Uh, still, I still browse eBay almost every day looking for a bargain, uh, Exodus also, and uh, a high scientific. So I'm a bit of a collector yeah. as well. I like to uh, have, have <laughs> those things that I was, we all do. Like one of the reasons yes. Atari is popular is because a lot of us old timers uh, grew up playing those games, you know, and uh, it's just a bit exactly. of, a bit of uh, fondness for all the things you enjoyed when you were a kid. I, I still have my Commodore 64 from when I was a kid, and you know, I, I've rebought all these memories, <laughs> as we all have, and yeah, that's why we're all doing it, because we have such fond memories. And there's a, there's a picture of the Sorcerer uh, computers, quite nice, uh, very, very retro beige color with a nice it's brown on it. A beautiful, well-designed machine, uh, and the aesthetics, what I was talking about, that one has it, and the uh, uh, Challenger mm -hmm. did not. Um, can yeah. I just refer to a question in the chat? So, uh, yes. How yeah. old was I when I taught myself 6502? I would have been about 13, 14, something like that. So. Nice. Yep, yep. And, and, and you did it with like the actual type in the codes, like no, no, uh, that's amazing. I mean, it, it's just one step removed, but it's still that's that's a makes it a lot harder to 
especially debug and read back what you've typed in as code you have to go okay but you would memorize the uh the uh the code for 6502 code very quickly yep. <laughs> uh being yep. just typing it in mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um, we did not have debugging so uh <laughs> uh, I, I, I did not actually, we didn't have the internet, so there's no way you could look things up. Uh, uh, right. Uh, so did you get, have a book or did you go to the library and check out 6502 uh, books or? There were a few magazines around in those days, um, which were, you know, the early days of uh, home computers. And so a lot of magazines had information on it, uh, but I just picked it up. Right. By osmosis really just learned a new an instructional uh, found I needed to figure out how to do something and just learned a little bit more. And generally, um, the way we uh, would convince some basic was we would just take one line of the basic program and we would try and convert that line into equivalent machine code. Uh, which ah, that's often, a great exercise. It wasn't too difficult. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it was just uh, a bit of all of the above, of, uh, you know, books where we could, magazines mostly. Uh, talking to friends and a lot of just experimentation so i would try a new up code and see if i could understand it uh, see what it did and, yeah. right yes yes it wasn't a very um, quick process <laughs> uh no i don't imagine so you'd you'd slowly build up to 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 those big games that you're talking about that you made but uh but these were borrowed computers these weren't your computers so tell us about not your first computer, but your first programmable device, um, because it wasn't a computer. <laughs> I could not afford a computer. And uh, one day this guy brought this thing into school, which absolutely blew me away. Uh, and he was um, acting as an agent, I guess, because his dad was selling them or something. But he brought in school <laughs> this Hewlett Packard HP 41C calculator, and it had alphanumerics. And it never occurred to me that a calculator could have letters on it and even though it was just printing on the screen hello world or something like that that was like awesome and i had to have one uh and um so can't remember how i how i got one i think i just badgered my grandparents until they <laughs> until they bought you one that's what i was yeah. going to do and so i got the whole whole works i got a card reader uh which which is a, a little plug-in plug-in thing you could connect to it and it would allow you to, well, there are the cards there in the screen. These are okay, yeah. magnetic cards on which you could store your programs. So, oh, okay. Uh, you could wow. uh, just feed them through the card reader and you wouldn't have to type in your program again. And I wrote a whole bunch nice. of uh, games. In fact, uh, thinking on it, my, my career, so to speak, I've focused on uh, puzzle games when I have a choice. Uh, so I wrote them last tomorrow. <laughs> True mastermind program on this. So this is, uh, this is actually wow. uh, how the cards worked. Um, wow. So it goes right through the calculator. That's really, really cool. Do you remember like how big of a program you could make or how much storage there was on those yeah. magnetic cards? I can't imagine it's like too much. No, uh, I'd be guessing, uh, it's not much, uh, <laughs> maybe a K something like that. Right. But the calculators were quite limited in what they could do. I remember I had one in university that could you could also program on, and I made little games as well. Mm -hmm. And it was just like it was just like that. I mean, it was a little bit later than that, but um, yeah, it just had a single line of of text on it, or maybe it had a bit of graphing to it as well. But yeah, you could you could do some programming, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it was fun trying to like push out a tiny little program on your calculator that did something. Mm -hmm. So, James, I have a fairly extensive collection of calculators these days, uh, which is I was just going to get to that. Not a big surprise, but the Cadre <laughs> ones in particular, there are only very few models uh, of the, the magnetic card reading. Uh, and I have all but one of them. And the one of them is oh, okay. from Soviet mm -hmm. Russia. And there's only one picture of it ever been seen. And I, I got a wow. guy in Russia who... When I was collecting, I had a, a Russian calculator website, and when I was collecting, he said, I have one of these machines, an MK47, and uh, I said, I'll buy it, uh, but first send me a picture, because the information is more important. I don't want to lose the information, because <laughs> we didn't have any information. Right. About it. 
And so we went back and forth and he wanted some money. And uh, the story goes that it was at his grandmother's house and the house burnt down before he got a chance to get a picture and the cat crater was oh. totally destroyed. So uh, that's my holy grail oh, in no. anything and everything is the Soviet magnetic <laughs> card reading calculator. Yeah, and I've got your uh, your website up uh, of your uh, calculator oh, yeah. collection. Yep, yep. So this was... Uh, I started this in 96 and um, so, okay, the story is uh, I collected slide rules and I wonder what Soviet slide rules would be like. So I wrote to about 150 members of the Soviet Academy of Sciences in 96 and um, I got about 20 replies uh, and I asked them to collect uh, slide rules for me. Uh, and wow. I knew people who collected calculators, so I asked them to piggyback calculators. And my wife, being very tolerant, lets me spend money <laughs> on what I want as long as I keep it break even. Uh, so I thought, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll get, the, get the slide rules for my collection and I will sell the calculators to all these weird calculator collectors uh, on the internet. <laughs> and so this, this first package arrived. The guy, the guy who, two of them actually um, agreed to. Um, be my agents and the first package that arrived had about six slide rules in and a few calculators and the slide rules were all the same uh, which is really disappointing oh, uh, because yeah. it turns out the Soviet state sends out to the factories a blueprint as this is what you will make and so that I'll make the same thing mm. but the calculators were in the genesis of the in the, in the this was in the mid 70s of uh, when they were being um, developed as new technology and the west and the east were somewhat separated so the soviets did mm. things differently uh, and these machines ah. were, were not designed for a, a marketplace which was competitive companies competing against each other so they were really poorly made uh, aesthetically <laughs> ugly uh, and I, I, I could not sell them for the life of me um the people were offering oh no a hundred dollars each for the slide rolls so i switched uh, and started collecting the calculators and eventually on that site I found about 150 different models which were unknown uh, and the site closed when it got um, what do you call some sort of virus script attached itself to all the pages and uh, oh, okay. you know, I started doing nasty things and so it just disappeared. But, uh, oh that's too bad it. yeah I'm looking we're, we're looking at it on archive.org of course mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah 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 so uh, I still have boxes of Soviet calculators. <laughs> I just can't move them. Nobody wants them. <laughs> maybe now. Maybe there's an interest now in them. I, am, I don't know. <laughs> you know, collecting, collecting uh, is about the hunt. It's not about the having. Uh, and it's not yes. about the selling or making money. It's just finding things. And I'm sure it's the same for Atari cartridges. Half the fun oh, is yeah. going to the markets and finding something new. And this is one of the reasons I really hate this water grading system, I think it is, where people put things in yes. plastic boxes and put 8.2 and they then think this is worth $6. <laughs> I, I hate all of that. Exactly. I think the fun is in the playing and the hunting, uh, not the having mm -hmm. uh, and not the, not the money. It is. And I kind of stopped collecting en masse when it all went online, like on eBay and everything cleared out from flea markets and things like that. Um, I, I buy things from time to time that I really, really want, but you know, it's the, the, the landscape has changed quite a bit um, with things like WADA and, and it becoming more of a, an industry, invest, industry and an yeah. investment market yeah. rather than a fun thing. Um, so I, I'm really happy about homebrew existing because it's kind of reinvigorated uh, the interest for me in in all of this and it's like oh there's new games I don't have to look for these old games and they're all you know packaged away behind plastic it's 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 a lot of fun um, so talk about your first full-fledged computer I'm, I'm guessing everybody can figure out what brand it was <laughs> but which one exactly was it that you uh, that you got first for yourself so my grandmother had uh died and left me a little bit of money uh, and I put all of that into an Atari 800 disk drive system. Uh, nice. My pride and joy, I loved that machine. Uh, 
and uh, I already had a, a decent understanding of 6502. Uh, right. So I started programming games on that pretty much right away. Uh, Pac-Man was my first first one. And uh, yep. I soon learned how slow BASIC is on the Atari. <laughs> uh, it's yeah. uh, almost unusable for any sort of decent game. Uh, and I... Uh, there's a, a small 256-byte area. From memory, it sits at uh, 1536 location, memory location on uh, the Atari. And you could put uh, machine code in that location and call it from BASIC. So again, oh, okay. I did a line-by-line -line translation of some of the, uh, let's say, uh, slow bits in my Pac-Man game. And mm. it went from running about one frame every three seconds to so fast that the Pac-Man went from one side of the screen to the other side before you <laughs> touch the joystick. So that was uh, right. the impetus to start writing everything in assembler uh, at the point. Right. And, and as you said, you had a kind of a history with assembler um, and, and translating basic uh, code into assembly. Um, so that was uh, obviously you saw the the advantage of using assembly. And I remember uh, typing in games from Commodore 64 magazines, and they would always have the joystick routine in assembly. Um, because that was one of the slowest things, and it would speed up the game considerably. So, um, yeah, I, I, I kind of can relate to to converting over some of the some of the uh, code into assembly to make it run faster. Um, so, with your transition from basic to assembly, how did that lead to programming your first, you know, big game? Let's say, uh, QB. So what you don't see is all the started and never finished stuff. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Back then, uh, we did not really know, even when I became a professional developer, we did not really know what made a good game. Uh, and so we were trying all sorts of different things. Uh, you know, Even what makes a good game idea now, it's you've got genres which you can pick from. We didn't really have that. Uh, and so some people were uh, just trying anything and everything that, that could be game-like. Uh, and so uh, my first truly finished big game, as you put it, was QB. Uh, it was uh, my own game concept, which was uh, inspired by a little puzzle game, uh, which was... Uh, that had a four by four grid of little tiles with one tile missing and they were all numbered. Right. And you had to slide them so they were in numerical order <laughs> on the grid. Uh, right. So I kind of uh, thought about someone standing on one of those tiles and moving them around to form a pattern. Uh, and yep. so I, I remember drawing this on a piece of paper and I've lost it, but the uh, drawing was pretty much exactly what I ended up with in the game. Uh, yeah. And I spent a long time on that game. Uh, one of the interesting things about it was that the graphics are drawn in a way I've not heard of any other game doing before or since. Is in that normally oh. you have your graphics stored in memory, uh, just a bunch of data bytes. Uh, there was not enough time to draw the screen doing that because the access to memory was slow. So I hardwired all of this drawing code by loading load 23 uh, or load, load the screen byte uh, and it with the mask value uh, or it with the new data value. So instead of reading from a table, all these okay. draw routines were as fast as I could possibly be by, uh, I don't know how to, how to give you an analogy. It's, uh, uh, <laughs> it's like, um, I can't, I just can't give an analogy. It's a very, very weird <laughs> it just is what it is. But uh, yeah. that's the way I managed to get the speed out of it. So I still- It looks fun. really, really slick. Cause I, I've never really looked at the 8-bit, uh, the Atari 8-bit version. I'm, I'm so used to the 2600 version, just like, um, 
uh, nostalgic said in the in the chat. He says, "I'm so used to the 2600 version of QB. It's odd to see an 8-bit version, <laughs> but it looks really, really clean and slick. It's it's beautiful, isometric uh, type game." So uh, it translated across very well to the 2600. That was a natural thing for me yeah. to write because I actually find this game very, very relaxing. Uh, once you understand the strategy behind it, uh, and for anyone, anyone who doesn't know, that uh, grid on the top is a pattern that you have to get by moving the large cubes on the grid you're actually standing on. Uh, but you can only move, you can only, okay, to move, a cube will either slide if where you're going is vacant or you jump to uh, the cube that's uh, right. already there. And you can only move to adjacent cubes, jump to adjacent cubes. So you kind of have to plan your movement of these cubes so that you can form a bridge to the ones that are in isolated positions and then come back across the bridge uh, to form the pattern. So the pattern changes. Yeah, there's a little bit of backwards thinking like you have to kind of look at your goal and work a little bit backwards but also work forwards and kind of meet in the middle that's the way i kind of play this game so when you're familiar with it it's all instinctive uh and i just sit there and roll out the screens and just find it very very <laughs> relaxing uh and you press the button by the way to get rid of the creatures and the the annoying thing about this is that nobody realizes that so they just up videos on YouTube right. of themselves getting killed time after time and I'm just like, <laughs> no! <laughs> no! <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, who needs instructions, right? So, <laughs> so the, the, um, um, it was the first game I wrote on uh, the 2600 uh, to completion mm -hmm. as well. Yes, yeah. So not many people might know this about you, but you're actually Dr. Davey. Uh, not just Andrew. You have a, a another first name. <laughs> um, and I'm going to put something up on the screen. Uh, maybe you can uh, explain how this relates to how you're Dr. Davey. So this is a, a robotic vehicle called Starbug. Uh, I built this. <laughs> Starbug, woo! <laughs> uh, it's a Starbug, as in uh, there's a TV show called Red Dwarf, uh, which the yeah. spaceship was called Starbug. Um, yep. I did not design this, but I built this particular one. Those stripes on it are the actual pattern from a skin of a Tasmanian tiger, which is an extinct, ah. extinct animal, um, a bit like a, a dog. Uh, so uh, this vehicle is an autonomous submersible that motors along underwater, uh, and I put a spectrometer on the front of it uh, so looking at the light reflecting off the seafloor and my PhD was related to mapping underwater habitat autonomously so it could uh, detect various wow. species of sea grasses and uh, uh, underwater benthic uh, terrain uh, and produce maps. So that was uh, in 2014, not too long. Mm. Wow. <laughs> That is really, really cool. And you did your PhD on that, you said? I did, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll address you as Dr. Davey from now on. <laughs> no. So, um, so uh, for me, lifelong education was really important. I try to encourage it in kids. Uh, and yep. uh, this was uh, actually more about proving that being a doctor is not special. It's just <laughs> that everyone who really wants to do something can do it. Uh, uh, yep. This is uh, for, let's say, personal reason to show that a doctor was not something special. Yeah, education is important and learning all the time, mm -hmm. I think, keeps everybody going and uh keeps your mind fresh as well mm -hmm. I, I love to learn new things and i know tanya does mm -hmm. too um so th related to qb um there was a thread posted on atari age uh, august 2018 about how your game and i remember when this was posted um somehow showed up on hundreds of discs all over the internet and then it led to the discovery 
of a lost game that you programmed with your brother. So this is a crazy story. How did this how did this all come about? Yeah, this was a, a huge surprise to me. It just uh, popped up randomly uh, in one of the threads. Why is Andrew Davies QB on all of my discs? And I, <laughs> I mean, you know, what the hell? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and you're like, what? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so my, my Atari was stolen in about 1986, something like that. Uh, oh. and all my discs were taken, so all of the work that I did uh, oh. in 84, 83 to 86, whatever, was just lost. Uh, and so I only had memories of a lot of those games for a while anyway. Oh my goodness. Uh, until recently. Uh, and so this particular thread um, came up and I sort of, uh, somebody was showing some of the graphics that they pulled off the discs and uh, the game was QB, and it was on on um, uh, all these public domain shareware discs, uh, 176 of them, something like that, which made no sense whatsoever to me. Uh, <laughs> also, there's other data on the disc, and there's one thing there called Andrew.bas, A-N-D-R-U dot B-A-S. And I had this very vague memory that I used to use that name. Uh, right. But I had no idea what it was. Uh, and so somebody... Um, actually found one of the disks with a uncorrupted version of Andrew.bass. And it turns out to be ah. a game that I in the very early 80s from my brother uh, when I was visiting on holiday. Uh, and I wrote it in BASIC on the Atari. And it's a, a Sokoban clone. I think in this thread down a bit lower, there's, uh, there's actually a picture of it. Uh, so this is this one of my games that I had not seen for 30 plus years. Uh, wow. Somewhere wow. Maybe in the second page. Uh, yeah. So uh, that was like, it's really weird because it, it, it means, there it is there. So um, very pretty, actually. Uh, this is just character, yeah. character graphics. Uh, but also shows my interest in puzzle games has been long term. Uh, I worked on Sokoban. This one is in 83. Uh, I did it again in 98. I did it again in 2020, something like that. Uh, yeah, lots of Sokobans. Yeah. <laughs> going back to the same themes. Uh, but this, this was a huge delight to me to see something that I only had dim memories of. Uh, and just yeah. to segue into... Uh, I had recently found a box of floppy disks uh, in a box somewhere, uh, and I realized they were Atari disks from my days when I did have my computer, and I sent those off to a computer history site who had uh, professional equipment, and they recovered uh, 20 wow. or so disks of software that I had written in the 80s. and including some games that uh, I'd not seen for many, many years. So. That's amazing. So what kind of condition were the discs in when you found them that you that had to facilitate you sending them off to a professional archivist? Well, I did not have an Atari at that stage anyway, but uh, mm. they okay. were moldy. The surface of the uh, wow. magnetic material had splotches all over it. Uh, mm. so, wow. Uh, they did, a, I think, of the 20 or so discs, they recovered 17. Uh, so that was uh, probably good that I did it when I did it. Uh, you yeah. know, another few years, maybe, maybe not so lucky. But uh, I, I have a thing about recovering lost information. So the calculator, Russian calculator site was about finding information that was lost or unknown. Uh, so for me, the recovery of my own games uh, was a, a great, great delight. I was very, very happy. Yeah, and here's a, a thread with some of the um, photos of some of the code and graphics from some of those um, lost games or lost code beginnings of games. And you know, some um, of the things looks... I have zero memory of until, <laughs> until I see the binary running. And I go, oh shit, yeah, I remember that, you know, I do. Like, yeah. 
It's yeah. Interesting what you have in your memory, but you need a trigger. Uh, and uh, these were triggers for yeah. me to finally recall. As I said earlier in the show, uh, there's a lot of experiments you don't see before a finished game. And this one just above uh, was one of those. So uh, this one here, Gabo Joe. Uh, yeah. Yep. I'm very good at writing systems and I'm terrible at gameplay. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've i archived my old attempts at games and programs from my C64 as well. So I understand the, the, the nostalgia and going back and not even remember doing them until you r actually run them. It's like, oh, what is this? And you're just running some randomly named program that you made. It's like, oh my God, I remember this now, right? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great to, wow. to be able to revisit all this old stuff as well. Another treasure rediscovered. This is piracy. Oh, that's nice. Wow. That's, that's so good. My so friend great. who owned the Ohio Scientific Challenger one, he wrote that, David mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we, we used to mm -hmm. compete against each other and uh, try and write the best games. So it was a very uh, <laughs> good environment to be learning stuff, how to write efficient uh, code. Uh, that was uh, part of my, uh, my experience in becoming a... Uh, very particular about uh, writing things uh, well. <laughs> yeah, and and did you get in touch with any of these people that you collaborated with or had uh, games with, like David Pentecost? Did he, you he was, send this to him? He was best man at my wedding. Uh, I haven't mm -hmm. been ah. in touch with him for some time. Uh, people drift apart, but I, he's the type of friend I'd say just always a friend and I could go to him in 20 years and we'd still be, you know, uh, happy to help each other. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's really great. Um, so um, tell us about how QB led you to the start of your professional programming career and what so, were some of the first games that you worked on? I was... Uh, Unemployed, I dropped out of uni when I was 17 or so. Uh, college, so college for you American friends. Uh, so <laughs> yeah. it's called university here and uh, I dropped out. Same in Canada. Uh, Same in Canada, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I needed, needed to work and uh, found a, a job, uh, just a, a technical assistant in uh, Australia's science organization called CSIRO and my boss knew that I programmed games uh, as a hobby and one day he came in and brought a job ad that he'd seen in a paper from the mainland they were looking for games programmers so I went well I've just written a game I'll send it off and <laughs> see what they think uh, and they hired me on the spot and uh, so oh, I was yeah. uh, paid $17,500 Australia in 1985. Uh, wow, uh, that's huge money then. <laughs> that's really good. Well, it was pretty good. Uh, and so yeah. that was my, uh, I was at home at that stage. So I left home and went to another state and started working, got a you know an apartment um, and started working on the Commodore 64, uh, which I had never seen and was actually the evil competitor to Atari. <laughs> so, uh, True. We were in great competition against each other in terms of uh, people who liked Commodore and people who liked Atari were always going on about who had the better machine <laughs> and who had better colors. So you eventually did go to the dark side. As you mentioned earlier, you did. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so to the, uh, it's taken me a long time to call things sprites because the proper name for them is missiles uh, that's the Atari term play missiles uh, and Commodore yeah. was sprites so I refused to call them sprites for the longest time <laughs> Just because, uh, but uh, so Commodore uh, I started programming that pretty much the first day I walked in the door uh, on my first game so let me just say when you're programming for a games company you don't really get to choose what games you write uh, it just gets right. given to you you are going to write a game about X or we have the license for this movie write a game about that uh, so um, 
often uh, the games are constrained by very tight timelines and the need to uh, restrict yourself to certain genres which have been predecided for you. So this was Max's Revenge. Uh, it was uh, just kind of like a text sort of story, I guess you'd call it. Uh, <laughs> an interactive yeah. a bit of um, choosing numbers and selling and buying things. Don't really remember a lot about it. Uh, other than right. just seeing, seeing this. I can tell you some interesting things about the technical. You see that unpacking there, that, that screen door is just bizarre. Um, and uh, when I joined the company, they already had this compression system for drawing stuff, uh, storing graphics in a efficient format. Uh, and yeah. what they had was a, a tool which would take an image and undraw the image. So. Uh, if you imagine an artist okay. who's drawing these images, he's drawing lines and is filling in with color and is drawing pixels. So this tool would yep. reverse that process and try to undraw, it would unfill and undraw straight lines and undraw pixels until it had nothing left on the screen. And those that series of commands could be used to redraw the screen. So <laughs> that was ah. the impression which was used. So when you see this thing drawing here, that is drawing from a set of commands uh, as to how to... So we did not have JPEGs. They hadn't been invented. Uh, we didn't right. have uh, PNGs. Uh, we did not have GIFs. So we kind of made our own compression format. In hindsight, there are much better ways to do this with character graphics. <laughs> but that was, that was pretty much... What yeah, I remember a lot of games back then drawing like that, and I always wondered why they did that and not just store it as a single image. But, of course, there's memory constraints and disk constraints, and it, it was fairly innovative. It looked, I, always looked cool to me. It I did. It's like, oh, you can it. see it actually draw it, but I'm like, yeah. oh, it takes so forever <laughs> if you want to skip through some screens, especially adventure games, mm. text adventure games that had the graphical interface. It's like, oh, I have to go three screens over, and it takes forever. Um, but we recently played a game on the Atari 8-bit that kind of did what you're talking about, where it undraws it. Mm. Remember that game where you fill in the screen by picking a color and you make it almost disappear yeah. piece by piece? Yeah. It, it was almost like what you're talking about, where you're undrawing the screen, the making it all eventually well, that, that was one the, color. The, the purpose of the game. Yeah, the goal yeah. was to undraw the screen. But yeah. So that, that's really, really... Uh, Interesting. Now that now I know why they did that back so then, I, I rather than just store it. And I think that's brilliant, but completely insane. You know, <laughs> <laughs> why would you do that? But anyway, that's, <laughs> that was a given. I had to use that tool. Um, mm. And at the time, yeah. you know, as I said, we were, we were inventing things, and so this mm. was yeah. seen as the most efficient way to store graphics. Mm. Yep. Yeah, you either use what's available or spend time trying to innovate. And sometimes you just don't have time to spend to innovate, to to find a new compression scheme or mm -hmm. do it 10 percent, 50 percent faster. Um, so you made a bunch of games in the 1980s, such as Ardok the Barbarian, a.k.a. Asterix and the Magic Cauldron. Uh, Street Hassle, aka Bop and Rumble, which I I I remember playing that game on my C sixty four, and and going, this is a really strange game, but very interesting. <laughs> um, uh, Junior Pac Man, Super Pac Man, uh, uh, for the all for the C sixty four. So you did quite a string of games um, for the C sixty four. Yeah. Uh, so I, I occasionally go and uh, look at the YouTube. Uh, playthroughs for some of these, uh, uh, right. particularly to just see what people are saying in the comments, uh, because yeah. I think a lot of those games are really bad games, uh, but uh, <laughs> they're bad for different reasons. Like uh, people have absolutely savaged the Super Pac-Man, for example. And mm. Mm. when I wrote that, I was sent to an arcade where we had one, and I was given maybe uh, an hour, two hours to play it, and I had to go back right. and write it. And I had no understanding of how the game actually worked. 
or the, that there were patterns right. or even uh, <laughs> it was just uh, and I took some photos of the scan and stuff like that so the information was not there to enable um, a, a decent uh, implementation uh, with, the, with the finesse and understanding of the game mechanics so we often did not have information from the arcade manufacturers uh, to say Right. Here's the source code. Mm -hmm. Here's the graphics. We had to just try and emulate what we saw, and so <laughs> these these people who, you know, their lifelong love is Super Pac-Man, and they come and play the Commodore 64 version, and they go, "What the hell is right. this?" Uh, <laughs> and I, I, yeah. I go, yeah, "Yeah, look, you're totally right. Uh, me bad, but that's." <laughs> And you hear that story. Personal responsibility for these things. You know, it's hard not to feel bad about it. Well, you yeah. Got to move on. Let it go. Because you knew your situation at the time, but they, they don't know what the environment was back then. And I, I hear that time and time again, listening to people who uh, ported games in the 80s for various systems mm -hmm. and they tell the exact same story that you did they they got to go to the arcade look at it for 10 minutes scribble some stuff down <laughs> and all of a sudden they're making a game say for the 2600 mm. that's going to sell a million copies and it just blows my mind that <laughs> that's all they were given they didn't have like a full list of even rules for the game mm. let alone the source code and and yeah i can so i can understand the the frustration looking at these comments on on youtube and them not understanding so there, how it was there's a couple of things um first of all i just want to address one of the questions in the chat uh before it right so the question is do i put easter eggs in my games uh the answer is yes i do uh and uh, <laughs> so i will say that uh boulder dash for example has an easter egg um, uh -huh. The uh, games I wrote in the 80s, generally no, uh, but I am aware of, I, I was kind of afraid of getting in trouble for doing that, uh, <laughs> but I right. am aware of some of the other guys in the company who did. So one day we were sitting down, there used to be these magazines that would review the games, uh, like ZZAP I think was one of them, uh, these were English magazines mostly, and uh, somebody had written in to the magazine and said, I was just playing this game from Beam Software, Melbourne House, who I work for. He said, and there's this naked woman lying down in the jungle. And we, <laughs> we didn't know anything about it. Uh, so we uh, got the oh. game out and sure enough, one of the artists had arranged the forest in the background. So it formed a profile of this woman, nude woman lying down. Wow. Wow. <laughs> A huge laugh. Uh, <laughs> there's another one where um, one of the programmers had... Uh, so we, we had to develop for constrained resources, particularly on Nintendo. Uh, so you'd be given a cartridge size of, say, 8K, and you'd have to fit everything into 8K. One of the programmers uh, coming up to a deadline could not fit everything into 8K, so at the last minute he was given 16K, uh, which meant... Mm. He only really needed 9K, so he had, you know, uh, 7K of space to put the Easter eggs. He put a whole series of fairly savage images uh, talking about people in the company and how he was not a very oh, happy boy. person. And, uh, oh, boy. So I and probably not found out for many, many years later after somebody disassembled the yeah. the game. You can, yeah. you can dig wow. them up. Uh, I think it was the game was... Um, uh days of thunder i think it was uh, right i think i've heard this story somewhere yeah, yeah um, that's that's funny i got off relatively lightly but uh <laughs> it made me realize you've got to be careful what you put in an easter egg because it will be discovered eventually mm -hmm. oh eventually yeah oh for sure so moving on to your nes era um you went to work on games um for the nes like bad street brawler um, which you which you said made the top ten worst ever NES games, which I can imagine can hit pretty hard, understandably. 
Uh, no, um, no, but in... no, because I agree. No? Uh, I have to tell you why, though. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> You're like, yep, I earned it. <laughs> so, well, sometimes you put into a position you just can't escape. And so mm. in the case of yep. uh, Bad Street Brawler, it was actually a Commodore 64 game, which you just mentioned, Street Hassle, uh, which yes. is also yep. known as Bad mm. Street Brawler, uh, which was actually a fun game. It was It was bizarre, but fun. And yep. the um, Commodore version was just been finished while we had a team of engineers reverse engineering this really interesting new console from Japan called the Famicom. Uh, and mm. I remember the day I found out that... Uh, so they were just basically taking the cartridges and dumping the, the ROM and trying to disassemble using various disassemblers to see what the processor was. Uh, and we found out it was a 6502. And I thought, uh -huh. brilliant, I'll, yep. I'll be able to, uh, I know 6502, so I'll be able to program it. And uh, meanwhile, the, the guys doing the disassembly were sort of just changing bytes here and there and seeing what happened to the game. So you'd see the mm. sprites disappear or you'd see them flip or you'd see a color change. And so they started to build up this programmer's manual of this bit <laughs> in this location does this. Um, but most of the manual simply said, I do not know what this does. Uh, <laughs> when um, they were reverse engineering, they were trying to duplicate the systems that we had written for the Commodore 64 version of Street Hustle. So a spark mm. draw system, a scrolling system, etc. So right. they had the fundamentals in when it was handed over to me. And I was, uh, I was told, the systems are all written the manual is here. You've got two weeks to finish it. And oh my god! Nine, <laughs> oh my nine god. months later, I was still going. Uh, it was no kidding, yeah. Because uh, we just did not understand the machine, uh, and the game design, which was suitable for a Commodore 64, was completely unsuitable for a Nintendo because of the size of the sprites, mm. for example. Mm. So it was yeah. just something I never thought was a good idea in the first place and I did not have the information to do it so I already felt bad about it and the, the game got shelved it was like right we've learned we've learned our we learned how to program now we know what to do let's write some decent games on it so um, maybe a year later my boss came to me and he said I've got some great news we've just sold the Nintendo version dig up your backup discs and uh, you've got two weeks oh. to finish it and I went, oh my Ooh. god well my first reaction was what backup discs better for the world if i didn't actually find them but unfortunately i, <laughs> I did find them uh, and, um, so what had happened was uh there was this new device called a power glove uh from mattel right and power yeah. glove mm. is a three-dimensional control device that lets you do gestures in 3D. Uh, so you just move your hand around to lift or to the jump would be like that. And um, yep. <laughs> the idea was Very that, awkward. Uh, the power glove sends, the cartridge sends codes to the power glove to tell it how to encode the gestures into moves for a game. So for each yep. game, you'd have to have a different set of uh, information for the power glove. So the idea was that Bad Street Brawler would be a host. You plug in Bad Street Brawler, you choose the game you want to play, which might be, I don't know, Super Mario Brothers. Uh, you'd send the code from Bad Street Brawler to the glove. Then the glove would be set up to play the game you want to play. And you unplug Bad, Bad Street Brawler, you plug in Mario Brothers, and off you go. So it was like a host for uh, other games. So it was never, uh -huh. ever never had the chance to be a good game and i had a mm. pretty much a mental breakdown uh doing that and coming back to it i hated it uh this so Ugh. when when uh i saw that this was in the list of the top 10 worst nes games ever made i went yes totally i absolutely agree. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and, uh, I, I felt awful about that game for the longest time um until I did yeah. a, uh, a, a conference presentation at PAX 2016, 
which was yeah. my opportunity to set the record straight and really just say, hey, look, you know, it wasn't my fault. Uh, and I'm glad I did that because I no longer feel that awful embarrassment about it. It's just, it's bad. It's bad for reasons beyond my control. Uh, and I'm now, yeah. I'm now past that. So that's. Yeah. Because like you said, you didn't have a you didn't have control over the games, the timeline. Um, you were time. pretty much forced forced into releasing something you didn't want to even release. Yeah. yeah. So we have a question from the chat. Um, how hard was it mo to move between all those different machines? Like you said, obviously they're all six five zero two between uh, the Atari C sixty four and and NES, but um, they handle things very differently beyond the basics of incrementing and transferring data between different um, parts of memory. C64 and uh, uh, Atari. That's from Vitoco. Weren't too different. Uh, I actually really liked the C64. Uh, I said it was the, the enemy, but after working on it for a while, it's a lovely machine. Uh, and I really enjoyed working on that. Uh, Except it, for the colors, maybe. The mm -hmm. colors are a bit, a bit weird. The Atari just destroys the c64 for colors it makes up for it with a better sprout system uh, so yeah. each machine has pros and cons so uh, i didn't have difficulty switching between those two because generally of what you call registers graphics registers uh, these are just locations in memory where you write values and certain things happen so uh, once you understand the the operation of the registers you can design things but the uh, NES was somewhat different in that uh, all the, um, it did have registers too, but the graphics were kind of weird in that you had to transfer things to and from uh, screen memory through writes to a register. So there wasn't this really memory map that you could use that you had on the Atari and Commodore 64. So also, uh, I guess my views on the NES are somewhat colored by that manual I had, which is full of <laughs> do not know what this yeah. does. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that can be quite limiting, I'm sure. <laughs> so I think it's pretty easy to switch between machines once you have the fundamentals, though. Mm -hmm. So uh, so after um, that, you, you worked on games like Hunt for Red October, Three Stooges for NES, Mech Warrior and WCW Brawl Wrestling for SNES. And um, yeah, you kind of answered, like you, you look at the comments from time to time. And, and I know when I see negative comments on, on videos that I've made or projects that I've made, it takes time and maybe like 20 positive comments to get through that. Um, yeah, like how do you deal with like negativity in, in general? negative feedback in general because i know every artist in whatever realm they're making art in it's difficult when you get negative feedback even if it's constructive it's still it still hits a little bit i admire people who create things and i look at people mm -hmm. who criticize things and think that they their opinions are uh valuable uh just uh, don't really give much thought to their views. Um, I, I don't mind people <laughs> yeah. who don't like things. That's perfectly fine. But if people will credit, I saw one the other day that said that programmers from the 80s were lazy and stupid. Uh, so, you know, that Ugh. sort of opinion is, is like completely missing the whole context of the environment in which we're developing. Uh, the, the context of the comment was that... Um, the person thought that uh, Boulder Dash was a, a decent game, but it was spoiled by the fact that you had three lives or five lives and that you died, and so you had to restart from the beginning. And so that was right. lazy programmers who were trying to get get your money. Uh, uh, so, um, <laughs> I sometimes engage with those people and uh, tell them my views, but uh, really... People who create things, even if those things aren't very good, are making stuff. Um, and so yep. I like about your show that you 
will take even the simplest of games and treat it with honor and respect that it deserves. Uh, you know, not, yep. not saying something like, well, you know, I played a game yesterday that was 50 times better than this. Uh, <laughs> this, this is bo yeah. boring. Or you, you guys will pull the positives out. I think that's really useful. Um, I think that uh, people who just criticize things and don't understand the creative process, uh, their opinions don't, they don't register for me. Uh, uh, it doesn't bother me at all. Um, you know, I had one who said, I've, uh, I've spent hundreds of hours playing your shit turd games, Andrew. Fuck you. <laughs> So, oh, that's helpful feedback. I'm yeah. sure you can take that on board and, and move forward and make better games because of that. Uh... Well, who's the idiot here? Who played hundreds of hours of my game? <laughs> he just couldn't stop playing these games. I don't understand. So, um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't bother me. People, people will have friends. Uh, some people love my horrible games. So, <laughs> that's true and and i think because we're we are uh people who make things we're artists um we have a sensibility to know what goes into completing something or mm -hmm. starting something or being creative um because i think there's people who build things and there's people who tear down things and unfortunately the people who can't build things the the power the only power they have sometimes is to tear down yeah. other people's work and they don't understand the work that goes into it. Even the the simplest of games that are just three blocks on the screen, that is an accomplishment. Somebody thought of that on their own. They took the time to learn the programming language and they followed through to the end and had the, the bravery to put it out there to the mm -hmm. world as well. And, and invite criticism. And I think it's an accomplishment in itself just to do that. Mm -hmm. And I want to celebrate that on the show. I want to celebrate people's creativity and to encourage it. And I've seen, you know, doing the show five years now, I've seen people go from a really, really simple game where they've just started out and they're doing something really, really simple in terms of the scope of what you can do with these systems and they've gone on to make unbelievable things like mind-blowing things like take take uh Dianoid, for example who did amoeba jump mm -hmm. which is very simple on its surface it's a vertical scrolling using play field and one or two sprites on the screen at a time or player missile graphics um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and now you know he released load runner an official version of load runner for the yeah. 2600 and it is just mind-blowing how good mm -hmm. this load runner is and seeing that progression over and over again with multiple people and them not giving up them you know doing so well in this realm is just it just makes me so happy to see that mm -hmm. and so i can see how how people can go from from just starting something small and going to great things and and if they're given negative feedback rather than positive encouragement, um, maybe they'll quit. Maybe they'll stop doing it. And I want to be there to be that positive voice out there because I see so many video game shows, review shows. Yeah. All they do is tear down. And I just, it's so disheartening rather than lifting people up and making them feel good about what they've accomplished. Mm -hmm. I think this show has... Uh added a lot to the community in that respect uh, but also Atari Age forums have been a very positive place for oh, everybody yes. to participate mm -hmm. and uh, even the experienced developers will happily step in and help the newest programmers is, uh, optimize the code, uh, understand how the system works. So I think we're all very lucky to have a community that is working uh, so positively uh, and uh, encouraging everybody new. Yeah, it's it's one of the best communities I've ever been a part of. It's absolutely amazing and so collaborative and everybody lifts up everyone else. 
There are very few naysayers in the community and they get shut down fast and hard <laughs> whenever they bring their negativity into a thread. Mm -hmm. And I just I just love that. It's like people helping other people making their dreams come true, really, of making a video game when they used to pl just play the video games. Mm -hmm. And it's it's wonderful. We've got yeah. a question in the forum, which is, uh, what is my earliest memory of the Atari 2600? So, oh, you're hmm. stealing my questions. <laughs> okay. quite, quite funny, because I remember seeing this in a Kmart uh, about 1979. I thought it was absolutely yep. crap. Like, <laughs> I, I, I would not buy that system if you paid me. And it was, it was running Pac-Man. Uh, and oh. Uh, oh, I just saw yeah. nothing like the arcade. Uh, I hated it. Uh, <laughs> And, and so it uh, it's funny for me now that I love the love the machine so much. But that was my first impression. I, I would not touch it if you paid me. Oh yeah, like coming from a computer programmer's perspective, and you've been making games already, and then you go to the store and see something that's worse, a retail high end copy of a game that's from an arcade machine and and you're like well, why would anybody buy this this is a downgrade <laughs> from what i've been working on this is crazy but uh yeah you obviously grew to appreciate this quirky little machine the 2600 and and the hidden power it has in its quirkiness <laughs> um so one one more game before we move on to the 2600 um was a game called gravity angels which is quite an interesting concept um it was described as an interactive movie and you could play it on a dvd player um so can you tell us a little bit about this game and your involvement was was it like um like those laser disc games in the arcade where it's left right up down button and uh, like dragon's lair so when i left uh bm software uh, in about 1996 i was hired by a division of sega uh sega australia uh, and I was asked to develop a game for people who would hire a video from a video store but would not play a video game as, as like in the arcades. So it was basically create a new genre of entertainment. And right. um, so I, I worked on this thing we call Multipath Movies, which is a, effectively uh, a 3D version of the storybooks like Choose Your Own Story where you would read three pages mm -hmm. and then at the bottom of the third page it would say, do you want to kill the dragon or do you want to run away? Uh, and so uh, okay. you uh, essentially have a pathway through the book, uh, multiple pathways through the book. Uh, so this, um, in about 1996, the internet was really taking, taking it off, but everyone was on 4K modems or 1200 board modems uh so the idea of streaming video uh was completely out of the question uh it was just not possible to do uh so that we hit on the idea of if we download the textures and the 3d models and information about movement camera movement and positions uh and pathways through the story we could actually deliver a movie to these people and remember we're not we're not aiming at kids who play video games. We're not aiming at 3D gamers. We're aiming at people who would rent a movie and trying to give them some interactivity. Um, so this was the concept of these multipath movies. Uh, there are about a dozen of them. Uh, this particular one, Gravity Angels, is not very good graphics. The later ones are much better. But this one, mm. uh, we hired a cinema and we all packed into the cinema and watched it on the big screen, which was kind of a cool experience. Oh, wow. Uh, and um, I look back on these as uh, an interesting failure. Uh, the tools we had uh, were not, um, not good for editing 3D stuff. Uh, but, you know, okay. you, you go through a lot of, a lot of things, technologies don't work. Uh, and as far as implementing the concept, I thought it did an okay job. Uh, it's just the concept was yeah. not 
not the right thing. So, right. So, so th this would all be uh, pre-rendered uh, because it was on a DVD. This is nothing to do with real time. This was released on the PC as well, and it was also the, basically all compressed. It was none of it was no, real time, right? This was not. No, this was not pre-rendered. This was rendered on the fly by 3D. Okay. By a 3D engine. Uh, so okay. uh, we were hitting, I don't know, 60 frames a second, 30 frames a second. It was a really efficient 3D engine. Uh, so it was just in the, oh, okay. the models and the textures, and then it was being rendered on your machine uh, in real time. Okay. Before we had 3D um, graphics cards. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. So be very slow. <laughs> but you made it go 60 frames a second, which is amazing. But for the DVD version, obviously, it did need to be rendered, right? Uh, no, my memory is it was all operating the same. Oh, okay. The DVD was just oh, okay. a different medium, but it was the same technology. It was just uh, a renderer, a uh, 3D renderer, uh, drawing the things on the fly. Okay. Just the sound is quiet now. Oh, now he's loud. Oh, okay. I tried to fix something, and now he's quiet. Let me crank. Him. There we go. Should be better. Yeah, it was it was muting Andrew when we were talking. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, but I I yeah. fixed that. Unfortunately, it turned off the compression a bit, but okay, should be better now. So um, now we get into the twenty six hundred. Mm -hmm. So your first impressions obviously were terrible on the twenty six hundred, seeing it in the store. So when did you come around to it? Um, because I I saw that you were. At least back in 2000, probably a little bit earlier than that as well, you were on the Stella mailing list um, because I was doing some research for a game called The Core uh, about a week ago uh, or two weeks ago that uh, Thomas Jensch has has taken on to actually make it be be uh, become real instead of just one screenshot. Um, so, what was your earliest? I guess, involvement in, was it programming the 2600 or did you get interested in just looking at the games at first in the 2600? I, I stumbled on the big list, Stellar mailing list and saw them, saw they were discussing optimizing code and efficient algorithms. And I stepped in and basically shared a whole bunch of my tips and techniques uh, that I had learned over the years as a, a games developer. Just I uh, can't remember exactly, but efficient ways to multiply uh, using shifts instead of additions and just a whole bunch of uh, 6502 specific stuff. And okay. obviously uh, read more about the limits and uh, how the Atari 2600 worked from that list. And some people had demos which you could download and play. Uh, so I just uh, started to get involved and got the emulators running. I think I was using one called Z26 back then. Uh, and uh, started to just dabble in uh, learning how to form a, a frame, a display, uh, and just uh, started to think about well, this is a really limited platform. How would I, how would I do certain <laughs> things? And my first efforts were a Sokoban clone using Playfield graphics. Uh, right. and I think I used Playfield graphics because I didn't really understand the sprites properly. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. And so I put that on the list. Uh, hey, look at this interesting new game concept and nobody liked it so that got <laughs> that got dumped shall, well, shall, shall we take a look at that now <laughs> uh it's it was called push and it was from 1998 so i guess that's when it kind of all started up let's warm up the 2600 here <laughs> no don't, don't bother playing it i just just look at it there's nothing, nothing to... <laughs> we'll we'll look at it then we'll uh briefly glance at it. <laughs> so one of the things with the Atari Playfield is you just have one color. Uh, and in uh, Sokoban, you need to be able to distinguish between various objects on the screen. And since I was using Playfield, I was trying to get more than one color. And so this is a really right. early 
thinking of what I'm now doing in my current games, uh, trying to get, trying to use Playfield and get more color um, uh, on the screen. Uh, and this is doing it on a frame by frame basis. So one frame would be yellow, the next frame I'd draw the reds, uh, and merging right. pixels on and off in different frames, you get a blend of yellows and reds. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so Tanya, you So that started quite early, the, the, the blending of oh, colors. Yeah. Because yeah. I saw the display capabilities of the 2600 has been really, really limiting and uh, not right. able to do what I wanted to do uh, in, say, this circuit man. So, Tanya, the one on the right is the gray square, and you just you move that up, down, left, right. It's, it's basically pushing those red squares onto those wobbling wobbling things. But I don't think mm. it's like, don't, don't bother playing it. It's just... Uh, <laughs> There's some line count it's, issues anyway. Yeah, there are. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a technology it's demo. Oh, showing. oh, no video. <laughs> Yeah, it's having some trouble. It's, that's yeah, okay. That's okay. We'll, so, we'll, we'll switch away from that. It, it's, it, <laughs> it, it was not well received. Um, yeah. uh, in that I, I did, I did play it a bit. It, it's it's a very competent uh, Sokoban uh, a version of it. Um, it's, it's very interesting how it only uses Playfield because I had to look at how it was drawn and I'm like, how is this, how is this being drawn? But then you slow it down and it's like, oh, it's multiple passes and it's drawing different things at different times. And it's quite, uh, people should have seen it as innovative mm -hmm. and trying something experimental than, uh, than just going, oh, it's crap. <laughs> I, I, I was going back and uh, looking at these things in preparation for the show, James, and I yeah. recall at some point you uh, mentioned me as like the master of playfield graphics or something like that. And uh, I thought... <laughs> When I was looking back at these, that the, it's interesting to look back and see early on, I was already exploring how to yeah. use play for graphics. And there's a very clear uh, progression of capability in uh, an exploration uh, I find quite interesting in looking back at some of those oh, yeah. demos. Yeah, and, and we'll see the progression as we go through these programs on going from that to like people will see if people haven't seen some of this these demos that you've done and these new games that you've done you'll be astounded at what playfield graphics are capable of mm -hmm. um so let's um go to uh qb the um 2600 version next um so this went through an, is it? The... uh yeah that one that one yeah okay. so this went through a number of um, releases and iterations. You can press the button. There you go. We have to make it look like the top right corner. Um, so, like the original, the 2001 Philly Classic version, the deluxe edition, the production edition. Um, so you, maybe you can step us through these different iterations and yeah. and and uh, how this all came about. I'm a, a little embarrassed about how many different versions there are. Uh, <laughs> Partly came about because I, I think I, I started with uh, Here's the Video, releasing them, and then I did some through Atari Age, and then I did some for a show, and then I decided to make a wooden box using a sheltered workshop to make the, the box uh, and release a special edition. Uh, I should have just gone on and made a different game, but uh, you know, uh, I guess I milked that one for all it was worth. And uh, uh, there are a lot of versions out there, but they all play essentially the same. Uh, right. I think this one translated really, really well from the 8-bit version. Uh, oh, the, yeah. the shift to the flat 2D actually makes it a better game to play. Uh, I think what stands out for me in, in this one is that there were not many games that used playfield animation as part of the mechanics of the game uh and with all those right. all those squares that you jump on they're all playfield uh so there's quite a bit of playfield manipulation going on there with the pattern on the top so right, even the movement flashing. of the tiles is is playfield movement just the rough movement that you can get from playfield tiles because they're so fast moving you don't notice that it's you know uh playfield pixel movement at a time 
Yes, I think uh, an understanding of perception and how our brain interprets things uh, is one of the things that I've learned, uh, particularly in the more recent games. But yes, you're right. The, the, you know, we all, always think of scrolling or movement uh, in playful graphics as being very clunky. But if you do it right, uh, and take account of how we see things, uh, you can actually get very, very smooth movement. And perhaps we might see yep. something of that later on in the show. Yes, exactly. And and other people have, have taken Playfield graphics as well, say uh, John Champeau with um, Scramble, and uh, there's been other people have done that as well and, and used in the right situations um play field graphics can be extremely powerful and obviously we'll see that later on um to great extent actually so um, just on this game i made a huge loss on this game it cost me hundreds of dollars uh, uh because i released a version and shipped it to everyone which was then found out to have a crash in it uh and i was left with what do I do? Do I get everybody to ship back the cartridges at my expense and then fix them and right. then make a new one? Uh, it was like awful. And so I came up with an <laughs> oh. excellent solution is I figured that uh, I would offer to do that at my expense or they could uh, have a replacement board and they could keep the original buggy cartridge and collectors did not want to give up their buggy version because they figured it would be worth, <laughs> worth a decent amount of money. Of so all I had to do was ship the replacement uh, cartridge, which are very cheap. Uh, replacement board, sorry, not cartridge. So, uh, right. But it still cost me hundreds of dollars. Uh, and I, uh, yeah. no, not, not bitter about it, uh, but it, it shows the value of having people in the community playtest because uh, I was just doing this all myself. Uh, I've taken the opportunity in my latest effort to have a lot of people testing. Yeah, it's a big value in that, and, and I see that more and more. There's a lot of really good players that, like S. Ramirez, that helps out doing play testing and other developers and um, you know you set up private clubs so that you can test out various builds of it and and at the end it, you get a really really solid game so it's it's yeah we found out the hard way unfortunately with QB so it be, uh, turned you into a game philanthropist uh, giving <laughs> losing money on your game unfortunately so the worst thing about this game is the sound there's almost no sound in this game. Uh, and this is because uh, yeah. I never had to do sound when I was writing games professionally. We had sound ah. engineers who simply gave you uh, a file with a bunch of uh, numbers to feed into the sound routine saying play sound 27, play sound 56 and so on. And that would all work. Uh -huh. So I never learned how sound works. And as you know, I do not have very good hearing. So for me, sound has always been a bit of a black art mystery. And in QB in particular, I was running out of space in my 4K. So I put more work into the graphics and sound. Uh, one day, maybe I'll revisit this and do a nicer version with, with sound. <laughs> you know, it's, yet it's yet all, another all, version. <laughs> it's almost the 20 year anniversary where I come back to old ideas. So, ah, yeah. There you go. Um, so looking at your old QB uh, website on archive.org, you released games under the name Retroactive. Yeah. Um, was that name just for QB and did you take it further or was that kind of the end of that? Uh, I had a number of different names. Uh, Illogic, <laughs> Retroactive, Two-Headed Software. Uh, <laughs> it was nothing specific about it. Retroactive seemed a, a great name for a uh, Atari company. But uh, yeah. it's kind of like Activision and Retro Games. So, but uh, nothing special <laughs> about it. I think it was just a whimsical company name. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So this brings us to um, Boulder Dash, actually, now, uh, which is your next uh, big release. So let's pop that in, which has been recently uh, re released at uh, Atari Age for people who 
did not get it in the initial run. So maybe you can um, step us through the creation of Boulder Dash, why it was chosen, um, did you play it back in the day, um, and the um, amazing... Uh, Lee, you got it fully licensed as well, the first time and for the re reissue as well, which is uh, fairly unusual in the homebrew scene, actually. Yeah, so uh, yes, I did play it. Uh, it was one of my favorite games back in the 80s. Uh, it was when I came to the Stella Big List uh, and looking at the games that were on the Atari, it seemed pretty clear that Boulder Dodge was impossible on the Atari for a number of reasons, uh, just the uh, uh, graphics capabilities of the machine and the memory. Um, but uh, I started to think about, okay, but but if if we did do it, how would we do it? And I put up a demo, I think, uh, in the Atari age, uh, uh, I started to develop systems that uh, used a bank switching scheme that offered extra memory. Uh, the extra memory made things possible and there was a lot of discussion uh, between people on the forum but particularly Thomas Gents and myself about how would you possibly write Boulder Dash on this machine and uh, we had uh, almost a, a friendly competition uh, about uh, display systems just what how do we make something that looks like Boulder Dash not not right in the game. Just how do how do you make it look like Boulder Dash? And we eventually uh, settled on a system uh, called Chrono Color. Uh, it's basically a fairly uh, interesting uh, interleaving of on-off pixels and different colors on different scan lines to give you the impression that there are more colors. Than there actually are, uh, in fact, eight colors uh, instead of just one or two. Uh, and this enabled us to draw things, draw screens that look like Boulder Dash. Uh, so the first thing was showing that we could we could we could do something that looked like Boulder Dash, but the real issue was how could we possibly get something running fast enough to be Boulder Dash, uh, which seemed impossible. Um, but uh, the extra RAM made it possible to put in some pretty sophisticated pipelines of processing the background characters and the animating, animating crew and kind of figured out that in reality there are only a small number of things that are actually active in any frame in Boulder Dash. Right. So most of the boulders don't do anything. Because it's kind of a turn by turn base game rather than, you know, a high action game. Well, you'll, you'll see, you know, maybe two or three boulders falling. Sometimes you'll see 10. But most of the characters on that screen are not doing anything. Uh, and so I wrote some systems that took advantage of that. That was basically doing a, a, what I'd call it a diff or the difference between the last thing we drew and what needs to be drawn now, and that brought it down to, hey, we only really need to draw two boulders and put one blank space in this frame. Uh, so right. it was it was reducing it to a much simpler draw problem. Uh, I got those yep. systems running fairly early on and put it in uh, Atari Age forums, and Thomas basically became really interested in the possibilities and he and I then started a partnership of refining and optimizing everything. So it was a true partnership. Uh, although I had functional systems, I did not have graphics and I didn't have sound and I certainly didn't have the speed that we needed. So he and I, uh, I very fondly remember working with Thomas on this uh, over many years, so it took something like eight years of development. Uh, yeah. The systems are magnificent. It's like the the underlying architecture of this game is unbelievably complex, uh, 
And the yeah. fact that it manages to do this with pure 6502 and no hardware assist is still something I think is one of the best things I've ever written. Uh, Unbelievable. And, uh, uh, again, I stress it would not have happened without Thomas uh, as well. So this is a true cooperative effort. Uh, we contributed uh, each to our own, um, but uh, together the, the the result was much better than any of us would, either of us would have uh, managed to achieve. So all the while this was happening, I was um, talking with First uh, Software in the IP because I'm a big believer in honouring uh, intellectual property and they were very much against us releasing a version uh, but I asked for permission to release videos which they happily gave so I was able to post videos on the site and eventually it got so good and I'll put that in quotes, so good whether you think it's good or not, I like it uh, Oh it's good, it's, and, it's amazing and, for 2600 it, just it astounding. became it became likely that we could do the game justice on release a version which would be happy with so i started negotiations yeah. with first Star software which were very difficult because they uh held on to their ip very tightly uh as they should uh but eventually we got an agreement uh, to do a release, uh, but they would not budge on only 250 copies. Uh, so we Great. were we were bound. We signed contracts and everything. This was not like oh yes you can do this. This was lawyers, um, real stuff, yeah. real stuff. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, and they were very tough negotiators. So we Thomas and I did yeah. not get much money from that. Uh, it was more a labour of love, uh, and uh, then we had a competition for the packaging, and um, I really loved the packaging of this one, uh, although I think mm -hmm. using the same image for the label, the manual, and the box was overkill, I, I would probably do things <laughs> differently, Yeah, uh, but that's the way it's done these days. Uh, so I think um, overall this was a pride and joy for me uh, in Atari programming. Uh, although there may be better things around today, uh, this one has all of those constraints of the original hardware. Uh, just, yeah. just having extra RAM is the only thing we allowed ourselves. And it's just remarkable that it uh, is playable at all. Um, Tanya, just keep pushing. There you go. <laughs> so <laughs> you, you frustrate Don't me sometimes, look. Tanya. I, was, I sort of like I, I was going. I might, Don't look at the must screen, not watch Andrew. Tanya <laughs> playing my games because I'm just going to get distracted. Uh, <laughs> um, so this, um, so Boulder Dash is a. It's easy to see your Chrono Color um, style in this game. So maybe you can expand a little bit upon chrono color while while we can see it on the screen in uh, in use right, so in boulder dash there is only one color on any scan line in that screen it looks as though we have say the reddish brown and the green and the white side by side but we do not uh there's only a line of red a line of blue a line of green and then another line of red another line of blue so red is every three scan lines and the green is every three scan lines, and the blue or whatever, whatever colors we use, it doesn't have to be red, green, blue. They are essentially triplets of lines, which are, um, have pixels either on or off on each line. And so what happens is that our eye blends those together uh, and gives us the impression of seeing colors that aren't there. So with right. three lines, three different colors and pixels on and off, you effectively get eight different colors that we can pretend. We can trick the brain into thinking there are eight colors uh, just by very careful use of uh, pixels on and off for particular scan lines. So uh, it, it, right. it works really well. Uh, 
you think there are more colors on the screen, but uh, trust me, there's only one color on any line in this screen. <laughs> Yeah, very very clever use of of um, playfield, and the, and the that enemy on the screen right now is is drawn with playfield. So the really the only is is you everything is drawn with playfield. So the player, except for the, the top, the player line. itself is a spot. Uh, but oh, okay. Everything okay. else is playfield. Uh, and, yeah. uh, also, uh, keep in mind the resolution is only forty pixels across. So <laughs> you know those those bolder pixels wide so this is also yeah. a huge challenge is how do you make things look good um, even just big walls uh, with four pixels it's very hard to make a brick wall uh, but those those big walls <laughs> they look pretty good uh, you know uh, oh yeah yeah uh, it's it's the amazing that you've been able to adapt the game to that type of resolution and retain all of the gameplay that and it still exists there so i ha i had an awful lot of uh let's shall we say disagreement with thomas over <laughs> yeah. vast amounts lively of this game. discussion <laughs> uh, we yeah. yeah we are both perfectionists and uh we each had very strong views on the way some of those graphics should appear and the colors also Thomas wanted to be true to the Commodore 64 version, so the colors closely match that. I uh, right. I was more freeform on the colors, uh, so we spent months going back and forth, adjusting the colors, <laughs> and then Thomas would change them back, and I'd change them again to something I liked, and he'd change them back. And, uh, we we uh, got on each other's nerves a lot. Uh, but I really uh, fondly remember that time. Uh, although, <laughs> fondly. <laughs> uh, I, I, I would not like to go through it again. Uh, but this <laughs> Once was, is enough. This was a special <laughs> a special thing for hopefully Thomas as well. Uh, just the feeling yeah. that we were doing something that was impossible and creating something that was true to the original uh, kind of showed what it would have looked like on the Atari if they had released it back in the day. So. There's a question in the chat from Nostalgic. Uh, did you make any changes to levels, gameplay, etc., to accommodate the smaller screen size? Uh, yeah, uh, there's only one change. Uh, two changes. Uh, one of them is that you can look around. So I think yep. Tanya, uh, if you stop getting killed and uh, <laughs> There's the exit. If you, Wait, oh, I think just if there you, at the bottom? Yeah. Oh, okay. Play this for a while, but if you hold the button down, the background, just don't move, don't move, hold the button down. Yeah. Uh, see, now you can scroll left and right. Uh, you can look around. So uh, move, help move up and down, yeah. but keep the button pressed. You can look around the screen. So that was nice. one of the changes for the small small play field to allow you to ah. look around and see where things were. Uh, yeah, because Tanya was having a little bit of trouble finding the exit, so that kind of option yeah. was really handy yeah. for that. Yeah. Uh, so the other one was the uh, the uh, intermission intermittent intermission bonus screens, uh, which did not work. On the on the restricted screen that you can see, so we reduced the size okay. of those so that you could see everything in that ten by eight area. Uh, same sort of fundamentals in the gameplay, but a smaller area to do things in. So that was a concession we made for this version. But they're the only changes I remember. Everything else is pretty much uh, the same as the original. Ah, good. Um... Okay, let's see. Oh, I, th I thought another interesting thing that you uh, used to make Boulder Dash was the uh, calculations over multiple frames um, of, of what's happening in the game. Now, of course, there's like say chess where it does multiple calculations it, uh, on the 2600 it blanks out the screen to do it um but i i mean i may be uh, ignorant about it but are there any other games that you're aware of on the 2600 that does time slicing 
over multiple frames rather than, okay, I have just the vertical blank to do my, or the overscan to do the calculations. So, uh, no, I'm not aware of any, but uh, just to expand on what such a, that's, that's about is, um, so in the Atari, we have uh, what we call cycle counting, which is knowing how many microseconds each instruction takes. Uh, normally, you don't have to cycle count, but uh, there's only 76 cycles on a scan line. So if you're modifying things mid scan line, then you'll become familiar with cycle counting. Uh, you kind of do 20 cycles of stuff, and then you do your color change, for example. So. Uh, in Boulder Dash, this is extended to uh, all of the code. All of the code is cycle counted. So I know right. that when I'm processing a boulder that is falling, it needs 284 cycles to do it. So uh, the Atari has timers that you can set, and you can just check to see if, that, if they've expired. So in the vertical blank and the overscan, you start those timers off and when I come to do a boulder, I can say, do I have 284 cycles of time left? Mm. And if I don't, then I go, well, I can't process that boulder, but uh, I need to draw a blank on the screen and the blank only takes 112 cycles to draw. So do I have enough time to draw the blank? And so it's a set, right. essentially uh, a list of things that you need to draw uh, a several list of things and opportunistic code that basically says, oh, hey, I can do that in 30 cycles. <laughs> I'll just do that now because no one else, you know, uh, has wow. enough time to do so. So it's uh, constantly looking at the things that needs to be done and the available right. cycles there are and how long each one of those things takes and uh, effectively opportunistically uses all of the available time. Uh, to do right. things so it's as I said I think that's just so clever like really it, amazing use of the resources that you have like you said you didn't use any modern you know arm chips or accelerants in in this game so I guess that need was like you needed to do that kind of time slicing to make to make everything happen it was not uh something that we originally thought was ever going to be possible uh, and it's uh, as we got it faster and faster and faster we still realized that uh, we needed an order of magnitude improvement in speed uh, but these these things just came incrementally um, and so the system kind of evolved as the game evolved it wasn't that we sat down and created this amazing system in one go uh, it was driven by the need to speed up certain sections and some things were just too slow to operate in overscan so naturally you go well how can I break that into smaller units so I can do it in multiple units and so it was uh, uh, incremental development uh, with Thomas and I working together on uh, improving those and optimizing those small segments as much as we could yeah, and I, I do hear that in, in development cycles as well. Usually it's with, um, say, the compression of the graphics or levels, and, and people need to, oh, we have, we have too many levels, we have to compress it down, oh, I need to find 10 more bytes here and there, and, and compressing and finding better routines. Um, but this, but so it happens with every, every, every game to some extent, but this, this seems... This is quite an extreme <laughs> a level to go to 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 go. Okay, I don't, I can't do all the things I need to do in one one frame. So I guess uh, each each movement or uh, sometimes takes multiple frames. Like uh, you can't because the, the guy can't zip across the screen at sixty movements a second. So you have a little bit of extra r wiggle room in that respect. Yeah, you have eight to ten frames, uh, and uh, yeah. the scroll in particular, if you look at it closely, you'll see, you can see the screen updating sometimes. Things just have a little bit of lag or shear, and that's just okay. the draw systems uh, essentially not having time to do things, uh, and uh, we have the buffered list of uh, 
So uh, I just make a comment here. That's the wrong color. Uh, so you have the difficulty switch set to PAL or NTSC. Uh, so, oh, there we go. so you're probably looking at the wrong. Doesn't matter. Anyway, um, so I thought it looked a bit off, but I was like, "What's going on?" I had difficulty A set. Oh, that looks so much better. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. That's better. So um, yeah, yay. So uh, the the the, the thing to remember with this is that it took Thomas and I, who are average <laughs> average Atari <laughs> programmers eight years uh, to write this system. You're being so, modest. You're being very uh, modest. So there. this has had <laughs> this has had a lot more work put into it than most other games ever uh, written. Uh, it's it's yep. as I said, my pride and joy. And that's because it uh, it's had so much development work uh, put into it. And it's it's had it's ha it's been optimized until it's dead. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's nothing I could think of that we could do to make it any quicker than it is. <laughs> but, and speaking of that, um, well, before I get to that, there's a question. Did you take advantage of additional scan lines in PAL to do more calculations than you could in NTSC? That's a very interesting question. Uh, I, I think the PAL version is going uh, 312 lines, so we didn't at that stage create a 60 hertz power version. Um, so uh, the, the, the answer is there was no change required to the systems because all that was different between the PAL and NTSC version was the time available in the uh, vertical blank and overscans with right. different values. So with the fundamental systems which still looked at those time available and how long does this particular part of work take to do it was exactly the same so we had we oh, made okay. no changes at all to the code uh, in terms of optimization uh, it basically was already a fully functional optimal system uh, for power and so going to this new release we're just going to go a little out of order so because we have the new release in there um, can you tell us a little bit about how the new release came about and now it's an unlimited number of I know we went over this when it was uh, re when it was released we did Atari age day and and you um, appeared in video form um, was anything different between the old version and this version and and how did the renegotiation go because this is unlimited and you were limited to 250 so uh, it took uh, over a year for the original 250 copies to sell. Uh, so we initially thought we'd made a big mistake, and that uh, it was well, it was priced at $60, and we copped a lot of flack for that. Maybe 75. I can't remember. 75. Let's say $75. We copped a lot of a lot of flack for that. People were saying that we were profiting off the community. Uh, blah blah blah. Uh, and uh, of course. so people did not buy it because it was expensive. Uh, and so eventually, after a year, we started to get to the end of selling the 250, and we thought. Actually, we judged it perfectly. There was just enough market for 250 copies. End of story. Right. That's all that anybody will ever want. And then we started <laughs> getting people complaining and saying, how, how dare you put a limited release out that I can't buy? <laughs> uh, you can't win, Andrew. You I, just can't win. <laughs> I, I, I want a copy of Boulder Dash, and you will sell me one. It's like, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a... Uh, People were not um, happy that they felt they had been <laughs> uh, restricted in their ability to get a new toy. And so now they're more than willing to pay the 75 and now there's no copies left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, for us, we were completely powerless because we had that uh, legal agreement with First Our Software yeah. that 250 was it. Uh, and so we had also made some, uh, what would be the word, uh, indications that we were not going to do a re-release. Uh, right. However, um, 
Over the years, there have been continual approaches to myself and Thomas asking us to re-release. Uh, and my inclination has always been to say no uh, until the IP changed hands and uh, BBG mm -hmm. Software bought the rights to Boulder Dash from First Star Software about four years ago. Uh, and uh, at that point, uh, it seemed reasonable that uh, we could consider doing a re-release uh, for BBG. Uh, but my concern was that we would upset people who, who had bought the original, and we did put some feelers out to see how the community right. felt about that. And the overall consensus was, go for it. I'd really like to see a release. So, we went into negotiations with BBG, who were much less strict about their requirements for the number of copies, uh, and they welcomed a unlimited release. And so we made some changes and fixes, uh, fixed a bug, uh, made some color changes, changed the a little bit uh, to make them better. Color changes yet again. Did it sway toward, towards uh, Thomas or yourself this time? <laughs> um, I think Thomas feels that uh, I always got what I wanted in this game and he was, <laughs> he was the, the one who lost out. So in this one, <laughs> I took a, a back seat and I let Thomas drive yeah. the changes for the most part, particularly for yeah. the manual and the box. I had nothing to do with those uh, other yeah. than giving my approval. Uh, I was happy to let uh, that and that do. probably helped um, the people who owned the original Boulder Dash to know that it's quite different. It's a quite different uh, look to the box, um, so that it's very, very distinguishable between the copy they own, if they're into like owning the first edition or having a rare copy of it. So that probably help them feel secure in their purchase, I guess. Yeah, if, actually, if the, the soil is completely different in the two versions. It's immediately obvious which is which, if you know what you're looking for. Uh, the other thing, right. the original had an Easter egg in, in it, which was so unlikely that you would ever get it, that the, the universe <laughs> would freeze over before anyone stumbled onto <laughs> the way to get the Easter oh, egg. Oh, boy. So in this new one, so, it's much, much easier. Uh, I have okay. yet to see anyone get it, and I'm not going to give any clues, but there is a, <laughs> a nice Easter egg in there uh, that will give. Yeah, Tanya and I are pretty good at finding bugs, but not Easter eggs. No. <laughs> We're really bad at finding Easter egg bugs. No problem. We'll yeah. find all the bugs. <laughs> so um, this one's unlimited. Uh, has some changes yeah. uh, and is cheaper. I, I'm actually very, very pleased to see this get into the hands of more people because you can imagine yeah. uh, working on something for eight years and then only been allowed to release 250 and probably a hundred of those yeah. have gone into collectors and yeah. never to be played. Uh, and so we and there's, see people and there's no this. binary. There's, there's a demo version of the original one. So and and the community has grown quite a bit so i can imagine the happiness of this unlimited release that'll make for all the boulder dash fans that have been drooling over copies uh now now can get a, get them as of like two days ago this is it's quite quite new that so, this new release is out i am aware of five people who managed to crack the original and uh build their own binaries and none of those ah. people released that into the community. So they just approached me privately nice. and said, can you confirm that this is a, a correct binary, which I did. Uh, and so <laughs> it's, it's a nice indication of the uh, trust uh, and respect uh, that we have. Yes. Uh, yeah. Mm. yeah. And I've seen that time and time again in the forums as well, where somebody say accidentally post something that they really shouldn't have, have and um, everybody says delete that immediately that should not be going around and it gets deleted by the person who posted it so it's a very like they unknowingly posted so the community is very very uh, respectful because they know how tight-knit this is and how 
important everything is to everyone and to not make it fall apart like that. So it's it's great to hear stories like that and just reconfirms how, how awesome the community is. Um, so that takes us to um, not this book, but where this book came from. <laughs> Um, so this is uh, Atari 2600 Programming for Newbies. And uh, in 2003, you started posting um, uh, a series of lessons, let's say, and instructions uh, for people um, to follow along to learn about uh, the Atari 2600. So maybe you can uh, talk a little bit about the motivation behind uh, doing that. Yeah, uh, so um, I had threatened to do this a few years earlier. I ran across a post where I said maybe this would be a good idea for someone to write a tutorial on how to program Atari. And um, there was some trigger where I just thought, oh, well, I'll just write something. And uh, I started started this uh, thread on programming for newbies. and. Um, the intention was to just make it a little bit easier for people to understand how it all worked and to share my knowledge at that stage. And I just uh, became a bit obsessed with it. And over the next week or two, I ended up churning out about 20 of these fairly long-winded posts, uh, taking, <laughs> taking you through how to get up and running with... Uh, programming on the uh, 2600 and um, the it was in assembly right uh, yeah uh, so well we didn't have any other option back then but so uh, yeah uh, oh right yeah in assembly it was how to set up the tools and the emulators and how to get your first binary working to display something on the screen and then you know how playford works and how sprouts work and all this sort of stuff and i went through that step by step uh, and uh, I think in a couple of weeks it was done, and then I added one or two extra chapters, so to speak, uh, a few years later. But uh, it all came together in a rush of creativity, and people were asking for exercises to do, and quite a few people got on board and uh, clarified some of the stuff, how to, how to explain it better. And it just ended up as being a, a thread on Atari Age, uh, and at some point, I was approached by Random Terrain and uh, asked for permission to clean it up and put it online, uh, which I was happy to let that happen. And somebody else approached me and asked if they could put it on, collate it into a, a book form, uh, put it on Lulu, I think it was. Also happy to do that. Uh, Happened to be Dionoid, Dion Olsthorn, who uh, yes, put the book so together. That's the second one, I think. Well, but anyway, um, oh, okay. I was delighted to see people uh, using this resource and sharing it in a way that was very, very cheap uh, for the community. It's about five dollars a copy or whatever. So, although it's not the best twenty six hundred book out there now, it was the first, and it uh, hopefully kickstarted a few people into programming their own games. I have no idea how many, but I suspect a few. Oh. <laughs> I, I bet a few, especially being one of the earlier instructional manuals besides the original 2600, you know, book that they put out in uh, the 70s or 80s, 70s, 79, I think. So, yeah, I mean, I've gone through this, um, reading reading some of the instructions, uh, in. Um, of it and starting my own 2600 games. When's, and, that, when's that coming uh, out, James? I'm waiting for a screenshot or <laughs> some announcement. Yeah. Well, uh, after the awards uh, segment, I'm going to take some time off, and that's when I'm going to be actually working on it. So, okay. you know, in a couple of months, I'll start posting about my development, and and uh, I may not make a game first. It's more like a demo first, um, and then I'll turn it into a game. So uh, very soon, months, months away. <laughs> so your your book will be very helpful. We shall see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll see. So I, I, um, I look back on that. You know, that was written twenty years ago, and in a couple of weeks, and. 
uh, some of it I would write differently. So, you know, how much effort do you yeah. spend on going back and fixing up something you did 20 years ago? Or, <laughs> yeah. I, I think there are better books out now. I think Nano Chess did one just recently. Yep. And I, yep. um, I was uh, uh, able to look at the early review copy of that and make some suggestions. So I think there are probably oh, great. better ones. There are better ones out there now. Uh, but uh, it was it was good for its time. Yeah, so I'll, I'll be referencing all the various uh, resources that are posted online for helping me out. And then, of course, posting in the Atari Age forums for anything I get stuck on. <laughs> um, so that takes us next to... There's a huge gap where not a lot happened <laughs> between... You, you might have maybe gone to school <laughs> during that time, possibly. Uh, is that is that the uh, era of uh, when you got your PhD? Uh, interesting thing. Things come and go. Uh, I did my PhD from 2011 to 2014, so that's probably one of those gaps. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Look, uh, also, sometimes I just get thoroughly pissed off with something. And uh, I think <laughs> I was, there was a little bit of drama in one of the forums where I just uh, took a break. Uh, you know, it's the same in any community. You just like, yeah, comes and goes. It's to be too right. much. So, yeah. So I, I think uh, I wasn't particularly interested in programming any new stuff for a while. And then, uh, yeah. I uh, got back into it Menu. maybe three years ago. Yeah, it, it uh, 2020, Sokobu. So you uh, revitalized your uh, box pushing uh, game. Oh, that's not going to work. We need to put in the multi cart. <laughs> <laughs> what, Boulder Dash doesn't have all your games on it? Okay, there we go. Sokobu. Um, so, uh, was this um, an effort to kind of upgrade it or uh, use your Chrono Color technology on Sokobu and nice. um, kind of give an upgrade, a new look to it? So, uh, Thomas and I wrote this magnificent engine, which we went to great efforts to legally keep the rights to. Uh, and uh, we had, uh, or I had, uh, removed everything related to Boulder Dash so that it was a standalone graphics engine which could draw Boulder Dash type screens. And the, um, the idea here was that uh, I wanted to encourage people to use it. And I thought that I would write a demo uh, game using it where I could actually release the source code. So uh, it mm. seemed uh, a very good uh, engine to use for Sokoban. And so I used that for this. And uh, I, uh, I was able to work on this um, publicly with the source code being released as I did it. So uh, is it not working for you? No, it won't start up. Maybe I have I picked the but wrong version of it. It's a buggy version. Don't, <laughs> yeah. don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah, uh, it's okay. So yeah. <laughs> essentially it's just using the uh, Boulder Dash engine uh, that we own the rights to. Um, but uh, so it's the same sort of scrollable uh, screen, uh, a larger play field right. area than you have. Uh, and um, this was uh, almost released. Uh, as a cartridge. So Soko okay. Boo, nobody likes that name, but Boo is my nickname. So this was just a, <laughs> a pun on uh, my nickname. Uh, and I kept, right, I kept, okay. kept the name primarily because it annoys people. Uh, if, <laughs> if nobody cared, I would have changed it, but people did care. So there you go. It's... Uh oh. Backfired <laughs> on them. <laughs> That's so, hilarious. Uh, this was so close to being finished. Somebody did the graphics for me, uh, and I can't remember his name, so I will try and dig that up. My apologies. Uh, and um, somebody else was working on the sound. As I said, I did not have any skills in sound. And there's this song I particularly liked called 
song for a found harmonium uh, and uh, music for a found harmonium. And uh, I wanted to get that in this game and the person who was doing it just became too busy on other things, so I just got put on hold. Uh, and that's that's where it got left. Uh, I think this was an okay implementation within the limits yep. of that engine, but now we have the ARM coprocessor, things can be done so much, so much better. Uh, so <laughs> and we'll see that. <laughs> I will We've got some demos coming up. I will never go back to that that engine again just because yep. it's so much easier to do things with the um yeah and i think alan the fur in the chats is correct that it's possibly a plus rom version that i'm running and that's probably why it's not okay. it's not well, can, not working out but that's fine we can see kind of the I, in the title I screen could probably run it here and share my screen if you wanted to see if that worked oh sure if you're able to get that up just give me a couple of seconds um, Sure. And I will uh, get the next thing ready. And a very impressive title screen on Sokobu, just using the chrono color. It's like very, very large graphics, but uh, still very recognizable of what it is, even though it's all completely drawn with playfield graphics in three colors. Uh, I can't think and talk at the same time. <laughs> so, <laughs> sure. yes, that's um, no problem. It, not uh, asking a question, it's okay. Uh, no, my browser's not letting me share the screen. No, it's not going to happen today. That's okay. Okay, so we shall move um, on to the next one. This this is oh, the God. beginning of my interest in can we draw full screen bitmaps using Chrono Color? Uh, and so, this title screen for Sakabu was that first. Very first demonstration of uh, uh, nothing, uh, of not Boulder Dash uh, character graphics, but actually bitmap graphics uh, using yes. using the Chrono Color. Uh, I was pretty proud of it at the time. Uh, it looked better uh, on the real thing than it does in emulators, but uh, it was a preemptive uh, version of what you will see in a few minutes, I suspect. So there's a question and, uh, on the uh, forum I'm just going to talk about while you're sure. prepping. So the question is, uh, yep. speaking of graphics and audio, how often do you collaborate on a project? And the uh, answer is... Good question. Not a lot. Uh, I tend <laughs> to be uh, a sole programmer. Uh, the work with Thomas came about because we both had skills that, and interest in that game. Uh, in Sokobu, I collaborated both on the sound and the music. Sorry, on the sound and the graphics, I mean, uh, the sprites in particular. Uh, in the plus card, which I've covered, uh, Anne Kerr is the inventor of that, but I really liked uh, having a play with that and did some work on the user interface and the fonts in particular. Uh, and uh, on the movie cart, I uh, worked a lot with... Um, oh, uh, Bay Russ, his uh, Bay Russ, his name is. Uh, Rob. Yep. Uh, and uh, just on the optimization of the, the underlying code. So. I tend to collaborate with things that interest me. Uh, I, right. I'm probably not particularly welcoming of people working on my code. Uh, it's not, <laughs> not because I'm, I'm grumpy about it. It just it doesn't occur to me to ask for help on my code generally. Uh, right. Uh, I kind of <laughs> have these esoteric areas I wander into, going, "What if?" Um, Let's see how we can do this. And uh, I like to push my own uh, limits on that. So I'm going to run Sokobu in, let me just, oh, there's the volume. OK, there we go. In an emulator so that we can see it. There we go. Let's 
so the idea in this is that you have to push those squares onto the pulsing dots. And uh, this code here is a, uh, a key which you can type in on, there's a website that actually records high scores. And so mm, if you go to the ah. website and enter this number, it will record that you have achieved a certain score uh, on that level. And that's still active, that website. Uh, but, uh, oh, nice. I think it hasn't been used for, for years. So the um, <laughs> Soko, Soko band screens get harder and harder, and you have to start uh, pushing blocks out of the way instead of directly onto the, the target position. Right. Uh, and so it's something like, I don't know, there's 120 or something different screens in this one. Uh, and you can see the graphics there, the boulders are very, very similar to boulder dash boulders. Uh, so it's clearly the same engine, but uh, different mm -hmm. gameplay. Right, yeah, and it's good kind of tutorial levels building up, uh, making it harder and harder each level, but progressively so that you kind of like, oh, okay, I get how to push this block now. And uh, yeah, it's a good progression. So, um, let's uh, uh, another hello. puzzle game, Joan. So, my interest, yes. my interest <laughs> in sort of action puzzlers seems to be consistent here. I think you could call mm. Boulder Dash an action pu puzzler. Um, mm. Definitely. And uh, QB yep. for sure. Uh, Sokoban. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sokoban. So, uh, you definitely have a, a genre that you love yeah. and are very consistent. Yeah. yeah. So the next one, which kind of follows the same path, is uh, chess. <laughs> not not as much action, but definitely a puzzler. So there we go. And this is chess using Chrono Color as well. So uh, this was a, a new engine. Uh, it did not use the character graphics that uh, Boulder Dash users. Boulder Dash was four pixels wide and the squares and chess are five. If you hold down a button, you'll see the thinking. Uh, so, oh, uh, okay. I've had a. I'm going to play chess really badly. When, when, <laughs> when it's moving, when the computer's moving, you can hold down a button and you see that, that pattern on the screen. So, oh, very so, nice. Th this is interesting because it's not forming a valid TV frame. It's uh, just touching the graphics registers and letting the, there's no overscan, there's no vertical blank, there's no sync signal being oh. sent. Uh, it's just wow. turning on the screen and letting the TV display what it will. Uh, but it actually works mm, very effectively right. for our thinking. And the reason it's not doing that is that the 6502 is busy calculating the chess move. Uh, it doesn't have time to do the screen. Uh, and this is my comment at the beginning of the show. I said that dual CPU uh, that uh, right. the Atari is working on would change the game for chess uh, because we could display and think at the same time. 100%. And I, and I remember the turbo was added to Stella, which I'm using, <laughs> because we played this game on the show and it would be just not playable without turbo yeah. because this takes quite a while to think. So if I turn on turbo, it's done immediately. So uh, I'm just going to uh, answer a couple of questions on the uh, chat. Sure. So uh, is Andrew a joystick or gamepad player? I have never seen a uh -huh. gamepad in my entire life. I don't know what it is. <laughs> so that, that's the answer to that one. Uh, How did you play your NES games? How did you test them then? What's a gamepad? Is that the little square thing? <laughs> yeah, a oh, D-pad, okay. I'm guessing. I'm a, I'm, yeah. a, I'm a joystick person. Atari joysticks are the way to play. Uh, okay. Although we did have one CX back 40s. in the 80s, which was a Mercury. You hold it in midair and it had Mercury inside it. And you try and, and they, were, yep. they were horrible. Uh, the, it was called Le Stick, and I've got one up there. Okay. It's terrible. Yes. <laughs> Is it still Mercury in it? Yeah, still Mercury. Ooh. It's It was featured in a That's video. That's like a toxic. Uh... <laughs> il illegal joystick. Illegal. It was featured in a video or it's something. It's good to know we've got a supply of Mercury up there somewhere. Yeah, waiting to uh, melt you, through. You oh, almost that's not good. certainly have one of everything, James. I reckon you oh. your collection would be something to behold. It's, I've got a few things. It's it's not bad. I went back in the '90s. I bought everything Atari I ran across in oh. like flea markets and 
a value village and things like that. So that's how I built it up. I reckon <laughs> that, that the actual purpose of Zero Page Timebo Show is for you to get demo copies and free things from all the developers. So you're... <laughs> <laughs> you found me out. <laughs> that's just a side bonus. I, I, I do enjoy doing the show. <laughs> it's all a facade for free stuff. So uh, <laughs> is there a console uh, that Andrew hasn't programmed a game for but would like to? Uh, ah. If I was going to tackle another machine, it would be probably the Vectrix. I think that's an Ooh. awesome machine, which uh, is so totally different that I would probably enjoy uh, having a go with that one. Yeah, right. that's my second choice as well, because it's just so unique, just like the 2600. The way it draws on the screen just reminds me so much of the 2600's like there's no frame buffer it's just you're directly drawing on the screen and it's just amazing <clears throat> so the next one is uh, a game that you helped out with uh, or took on or um, it's um, Atari 2600 soccer in 2020 let me just switch over to that and so uh, I, I can't I, remember almost no credit for this uh, the original program, I put it on the forums, and it had a number of uh, bugs, which seemed to me fairly straightforward to fix. And I was just really, really impressed with the uh, quality of the graphics that this guy had come up with. Uh, and I liked yes. very much uh, what I saw. And so, although I did fix this up, uh, I don't claim any credit for it. I just thought this was the very colorful, very well done use of the Sprite uh, tripling uh, hardware capabilities. Uh, uh, the issues I fixed were the scrolling and the ball movement was, was bad. And that, but um, yep. generally, uh, it was all there already. Uh, and credit to the original programmer. And I felt that it would be wrong for me to take over and turn this into a game. Uh, so I returned it to the forums uh, in a fixed state and said, hopefully uh, the original programmer will continue with it. And he never did. Yep. So it's just yeah, it's a unfortunate. sad thing, but <laughs> it's not my work. Uh, and I don't want to steal his thunder on this one. I think it's mm. well worth continuing with. It, I think this oh, yeah. is a fun party game, two player game when people are really drunk uh, and just uh, <laughs> try uh, that, that. I I hundred percent agree. It's such a fun implementation of foosball, um, and I always love playing two player games on the show, and and that's why I really glommed onto this yeah. this game especially. You need you need um, jersey colors. You be able to pick jersey colors that yes, would just blow that... <laughs> people away. You know, like, I'm purple. I'm, I'm Brazil. I'm and, yeah. And that would take nothing to add in. Just yeah. nothing at all. Anyway, yeah. but as you say, it's someone else's game, so it's <laughs> understandable. But this is you don't want to take a it too good far. Example of why sharing your source code on the forums is a good thing to yes. do because uh, yeah. rather than have it stuck in a a broken state forever at least mm. it's uh it looks pretty good now Playable. and someone else can mm -hmm. take it up uh, and continue with it yeah exactly because some people just move on out of programming and they just never return and just probably don't even know that you maybe helped out with this and and uh fixed a couple things or did they and that's just, unfortunate because it's just such don't a have cool the time concept. right you yeah they, they don't have the time yeah. anymore yeah, yeah. But whatever whatever happens this yeah. also shows how somebody who's not terribly experienced and who's just using the basic capabilities of the console can still create brilliant looking games with great gameplay you don't have to be you know uh, 10 yeah. years experience to do that yeah because they they use the strengths of the 2600 which is triplicate and vertical scrolling and play field to really great extent and it looks looks beautiful runs beautifully and uh yeah it's it's such a a great simple concept so my great, memory is, uh, this is if you keep it going the ball gets faster and faster and faster so after you know uh, two minutes with two players the ball is just pinging around that's but that's <laughs> that's when it gets really fun you know at the moment it's on oh yeah super slow 
Uh, so there's a there's that uh, gameplay element uh, which does improve it a lot. And that makes sense, and it kind of follows the, say, an arcade eth eth ethos, uh, ethos of like, yeah, we need your quarter. We got to speed up this game and get it done with, rather than like, oh, the two players are evenly matched. Let's add some more elements into it, and that's that's a really smart move. And it's just one of those tiny tweaks that may take a, ge a game from good to great, right? Um, so the next thing I want to go through is some some cool demos you've made. They're not really they're not really games. They're kind of showing off say the chrono color or pushing the limitations of of what you're trying to do with chrono color showing off showing off <laughs> <laughs> just showing off yeah. yeah so let's take a look uh first uh, at uh cubics which i thought was just brilliant this one yeah and it's a video game representation of a rubik's cube my system is... It's being very funny today for some reason. It's because I changed the frame rate. Oh. And it's being very naughty. Yeah. <laughs> Things that are normally working are... Not. Are having problems with the display. Let's see if we can display. Someone was making a comment in the chat that cats must must be hungry and oh yes they are. Oh yeah. But, uh, but we'll they're... wait till the end uh, of of the interview to feed them. <laughs> we'll just go to. Uh, uh, I am happy right to now. take yeah. a, a cat break and go and get a cup of tea. Yeah. Why don't we do yeah, that? Yeah, oh, we can sure. do that. I'm sure they want it. It's, so yep, uh, they'll be more I'll, than I'll happy just, if yes. somebody wants to ring the bell. It's yeah. tree time. Turn off my yum, camera and yum, go yum, get yum. myself a cup of tea, and you can feed the cats. Excellent. And I'll see you in five minutes. Excellent. Okay. You oh, oh, you RC know what? Seventy already rang the bell. Thank ah, you very much. <laughs> thank you. So we'll see you in a couple minutes. I have to get the treats. Hold on. <laughs> they're upstairs. <laughs> oh no, they're upstairs. <laughs> they're coming. They're coming. Okay, let's get the cat cam going. Thank you, RC70. Everyone needs a tea break. <laughs> That's right. Well, Andrew has such a extensive history that uh, I knew it would run a little long. I was trying to trying to compress it down, but we're almost there. We're so very, very, very close. You can't have the bells yet because you're going to be ringing them and be very upset that I'm not giving you treats. Tanya's coming right back. Cats were hungry. Oh, yeah. Those bites were burning a hole in my e-wallet. <laughs> it's very kind of a guest who's willing to take a break so the cats can get treats. Very true. That is very, very nice. The cats are important. They are the stars of the show. And uh, Atari went upstairs. He's like, I know where the treats are. I'm going to go upstairs with Tanya. Okay, everybody. Street time. <laughs> okay. So, on your marks, get set, ring. Ring the bell. Ring it. Ring it. Street time. Who wants a treat? Treat, treat, treat. Ring the bells. Ring the bells. They're all very confused. There oh. we go. Oh, oh, one to one. It's one all. Oh, <laughs> ring the bell accidentally. Oh, oh two my goodness. One. Two one for Sprite. He's, He's like catching it out of the air. Catching mid air. Yeah. That's amazing. Come on, Tari. Ring it. Oh. Two two. Nice one. Oh, oh, he's got it caught on the table leg. Oh, okay. three, two for Woo. Sprite. Oh, you're being bad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to give Atari a fighting chance. Oh, RC70 says, I'm glad you're running late. I had stupid adult stuff to do all night. Oh, no. Oh, adult stuff. Adulting three, three. is the worst. Adulting. <laughs> oh, four, three for, for Sprite. Sprite is just ahead. Just, just ahead. Just barely ahead. Oh, oh five, four five, for Sprite. Four. Both rang it at the same time. Yeah. Sprite's tail gets exponentially fluffier every day. Yeah. <laughs> five, four, six, four for Sprite. Uh-oh, pulling ahead now. Six, four, six, five. Atari's having some very strong rings today. Yeah. He's very confident in his rings. <laughs> six, five, and he's keeping up. Oh! Seven, five, but Sprite is now pulling ahead. Yes. It's six, five, Andrew. We're halfway seven, through five. the feeding. Seven, seven, five, sorry. Oh, eight, eight five, five for Sprite. Eight, six. Oh, oh no! my God! Oh, that's stolen. Stolen. One from him. He 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 gets one taken away. Oh yes. Yeah, because he ate one Seven of Atari's. Seven five. That is not allowed. No. 
<laughs> now he's back up to eight five. Eight five. Okay. Oh. Or should I give it to Atari? I should. Mm, no, just no, one eight off. Five. There eight you five. go. No, no, eight six now. Eight six. It's right there. It's right there. Two away from winning. There you go. Atari needs to. Oh, oh nine six. It's nine, game six. points. Even with the deduction. Oh, nine seven. You can do it, Atari. Oh, oh not if you take like... it away. <laughs> and. Oh. Nope. <gasps> Sprite is confused. I think he's lost his treat. He's oh, going for it anyway. 10-6. Ten. Ten, and consolation treats. Consolation treats. There we go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Fun stuff. Silly cats. Very silly cats. Oh my goodness. So we're back with Andrew. And I think I'm just going to run these demos um, on emulator just so we can make sure we're working okay. There we go. So the first one is Cubix. Let me get to that. Cubix. So a lot of these things, James, I just become interested in seeing if I can do something and not really trying to aim out of it. Uh, it occurred to me at some point that the Krona color would uh, where there are seven colors plus black. Uh, it works well for a Rebus cube, which has six colors, uh, six faces. So that was the right. motivation for this one. So it's a fully functional Rubik's cube with transitions as well. And you can turn any of the faces. You, you, what you do is you highlight them with, uh, with the button, or you can rotate the cube as well. Mm. It's absolutely astounding. And did you program in a scramble mode so that somebody has to unscramble it, or is it just like you? No, it's no. manual scrambling. I was just focusing on making a display that uh, a functional kit. Uh, scrambling would be <laughs> like a trivial uh, half an hour to run, but um, right. This is actually Chronicolor. Uh, I've since yep. invented a an update to this technology I call interleaved color ICC, which triples the resolution yep. of the the color. Uh, so rather than seeing a sort of um, let's say uh, sp spread out color lights so the green like there's gaps between the green uh, the colors in the new display oh, system look solid uh, so uh, we probably see a bit of that later on uh, but i'm quite interested right. in, in how to how to um, trick the human eye into seeing things mm. uh, using um, time and color and spatial blending uh, to try and give the impression of, of more colors or solid colors or uh, not just uh, playfield graphics, in other words. So that cube was totally, right. totally playfield. And that's that's astounding, especially the animation, like you were saying before, the, the speed obscures the movement. And this is even a, a, a more profound demo of movement of playfield. So um, this is a, uh, essentially, if you wanted to do graphics um, generically with Playfield, you need a, a, a way of drawing arbitrary bitmaps uh, on the screen. So this was a, a demo showing, although they're all cubes, there are three different colored cubes there. So there's three different bitmaps all being drawn in arbitrary positions on the screen in priority order at high speed. Uh, and so this is my right. effectively playfield sprite system in operation. And it was, I just used QB as an example uh, of, <laughs> because I QB requires things to be drawn in priority order. So uh, this was just an yeah. experiment. I think it works really well. Uh, this is still just kind of color. Oh. Uh, One second, we've lost um, power to our uh, headsets. headsets. <laughs> so. I am going to plug in some manual ones. Ran out of battery. So I guess they last for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Tanya will not be hearing. I can hear one. Yeah? Keep Is it long one. enough? Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. There Just we put go. it behind you. Put it behind you. So the show has gone on just a little bit longer than you expected, James. Oh, are we back? I was saying, Say something, Andrew. The show's there gone go. on just a little bit longer than you expected. <laughs> That's right. Well, we're almost there. It's a, a two-battery two show. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Should have got my other headphones out. Okay, so let's take a look at another demo that you've done. So just a comment on the uh, chat says uh, uh, explains why you want to program the vectrex. You probably enjoy playing with phosphor glow to make special effects, and that's totally it. I really do like mm. this idea of fooling the brain, using the characteristics of the hardware to try and make us feel as though uh, we're seeing things that aren't really exactly what's there. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and these are all extensions of it, and and Vectrex is is an amazing example of that. It's 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 a dot drawing lines, tricking our eye, <laughs> and just drawing them over and over again. Um, so this is uh, life in space. It was called. This was uh, first uh, discussed in Scientific American. Uh, in about 1960, uh, called The Game of Life by a mathematician called John Conway. And it's basically a set of very simple rules. Uh, the rules are something like, um, for any one of those cells, uh, one of those dots, uh, how many neighbors does it have? And if it has one neighbor, then it will die. If it has two or three, uh, it stays alive. Uh, yeah. And if it has four, then it reproduces, or something like that. Uh, it stays alive or yeah. comes alive. So um, just yeah. those rules are enough. If you apply the same rule across every dot position, uh, you get these amazing patterns forming. And it was called the game of life. And it's not really a game. This is a zero player game, uh, which uh, is what I kind <laughs> of like, uh, because you, you don't actually have to do anything. Uh, but, no, um, just watch the pretty colors. Just watch. Uh, <laughs> now, somebody took this output and set it to uh, some sort of music sense uh, video thing, which was pretty cool. Uh, but um, uh, this yes. also has uh, the ability to inject random dots so that it goes on. For, and it is a kind of pretty cool screensaver, if you want a screensaver for your uh, yes. 2600. Uh, but I've always been... There we go fascinated with uh, the math behind this one. Yeah, and especially the uh, different patterns that either move across the screen or are static. Like once in a while, you'll see something that is is uh, a holding pattern until something interferes with it mm -hmm. and it just stays the same. Or and and there's if anybody wants to look up and look more into this, there's a great Wikipedia page about the game of life, and it'll show you all the different patterns and there's huge structures that like spit off things off, and and there's like growth like machines they call them that that create things that go off into space and it's it's a very very fascinating um study so there is a previous atari implementation of life it's a very very rare cartridge i think it's called magic card or something like that uh oh, okay. and uh from the 80s uh has been done before, uh, but uh, unobtainium, and uh, this one at <laughs> least uh, you get to play with, and uh, it's a That's bit right. more colorful. And, and uh, you did this in um, CDF, uh, CDF, and um, so I'm guessing every frame is done. It's once per frame. You don't need that extra stuff that, like you did in Boulder Dash. A boulder dash to right. um, calculate every frame. So this There's is the beginning. So Daryl Sparse, uh, Sparseware uh, put out a uh, tutorial called Collect3, which explained how to program CDFJ, uh, bank switching scheme, uh, which is effectively an introduction to the use of the ARM processor uh, and all that entails. So uh, I started learning from that uh, tutorial uh, 
again, the value of having a community of people that share things uh, creates yes. opportunities for other people to do new stuff. So I appreciated that very much. And uh, yeah, essentially, um, the ARM gives you the opportunity to implement a video buffer on the Atari. So rather than having to do things in sync with the TV, uh, scan line by scan line, you can now just create a simple kernel to copy things from the video buffer and you put all your effort into the actual logic uh, of the game. So it speeds mm. up development, uh, makes games faster. Uh, it's just a, it's it's still Atari, but it's a different of Atari and it has different challenges. Uh, so I felt I had explored a lot of the things I was interested in in the base hardware and this was a new uh, opportunity to uh, push the limits in other directions and 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 i love both people who try to program for the existing hardware that was back in the 80s and also the people who love to push the hardware to its extreme limits as well like say you, were, you mentioned the movie cart before it's like oh my god somebody compressed a movie not not only the audio but the video and it can play back on a 2600 that's just as impressive to me as somebody making a 2k game that is so much fun and you just can't put it down both those things excite me in different ways and i think it excites people um programmers and developers as well in both ways and and you've done that say with uh boulder dash working within the confines of what existed back in the 80s, 70s, the original console, plus these new games and new demos you're working on using the ARM chip to push it even further. Yeah, um, but I'm not doing it for other people. So I'm doing it because I enjoy it. And I think that's mm -hmm. key to a lot of these things. I, I don't think Movie Cart was made for other people necessarily. It was made to say, is it possible? Can I create something? Uh, can I you know, use my skills to build this previously impossible thing? Uh, it's certainly not for the money, but it's, it's nice to have people say, uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, I, I, I must admit, I do like getting feedback like that, but uh, I don't really do it for any other reason than uh, my own enjoyment. Yeah, and and really, that's that's I think motivates a lot of us in this community. If not the most, the biggest driving factor is is doing it for ourselves. See what we can do with it. It's the challenge of doing the, the, it. The challenge yeah. of doing it, and yeah. yeah. So this one is um, spinning globe. <laughs> I don't know what else to call it. Yeah, and I thought, oh my god, it's unbelievable. Like you're like mapping something onto a globe and it's spinning and you can zoom in and out and it's all done in playfield like this is a recognizable map of the earth spinning around on a 26 so believe it or not this is uh, an offshoot from the boulder dash engine uh because it is drawing a flat map onto a um memory mapped area and then it's mapping that onto a spherical area on the screen uh it's it's interesting in that this is only one third of the resolution i can get so it looks wow. nice when it's going at speed like that um but i have kind of in in my to-do list uh, started some work on it is uh much, much higher resolution version. I think uh, this is probably, you would call this low res compared to the new version. And uh, I just, uh, right. so you see that sort of blockiness of the character graphics that won't be there uh, in the new right. version. So, but it, it is pretty cool uh, how it's doing this. Um, and it's not- and some of them even have animation in it and they're not static oh either. yeah it already it already should have that there i'm not sure if they're active but yeah um, animation is dead simple because the flat map is just a rectangular grid uh and you just change things on that grid 
Right. So, so, so if you zoom in a little bit, this one does have animation. This has coins, uh, which are, uh, it's really hard to see, but if you stop it spinning, yeah. On the X, uh, you see the things pulsing there. Yeah. So that's actually coins spinning from uh. the uh, from the uh, when hop demo. Uh, yes. So uh, this can be a lot better. I'm going to revisit this one, but it's <laughs> pretty cool uh, c proof of concept. Uh, yeah, and uh, moon. And uh, <laughs> at one point, I pressed down the key to keep it spinning, and there didn't seem to be an upper limit to the speed of the spinning globe. It just kept on going faster and faster and faster. I'm sure there is some upper limit, but like you could see it still changing after like five minutes of holding it down. It was unbelievable. Yeah, that's correct. It's a, a 32 bit speed. So each time you have it pressed, I think it adds one to the speed, so it will probably be <laughs> the lifetime of the Earth to get to its fastest. <laughs> I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah, this is... I turned on turbo and and it's still like cranking up. Yep. So, so I'm that... uh, pretty pleased with this. I think this is a pretty cool uh, for Atari. I uh, haven't seen anything like it before. Definitely. Um, let's see. And before we get to kind of the reveal of something you've been working on, um, can you talk a little bit about your contributions towards the plus card? Because you not only make your own games, but you, like you said, you, you help out with development on other people's things. You collaborate on code. You, you, you know, you help people who have questions about things. Um, and the plus card is a absolutely a incredible invention of not only a, a cartridge that can play games, but it also has a Wi-Fi card built into it so we can connect and go on to submit high scores on two tables. And so maybe you can talk a little bit about what you've done uh, with the plus card. Yeah, when I first saw this, I thought, what a cool idea. And I uh, built my own because uh, uh, Wolfgang Stubig, I think, uh, Anna Fair is uh, the yeah. guy who created this. And uh, what a brilliant idea. And uh, so I was keen to just uh, have a look at how, how it did its stuff. And uh, all the code was available. So I um, got that up and running. And there are a few things I did not like. Um, in the user interface, so rather than complain about them, I thought, well, I'll just have a go at uh, seeing if I can contribute uh, and learnt a little bit about how the code was working. And uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure if it was the first thing, but I really did not like the font <laughs> it was using. <laughs> so, yes. you know, things first, I, I changed it to a font I liked, uh, and then uh, just did some work on the user interface, and um, that that worked out pretty well. And uh, was incorporated into the plus code code base. Uh, just made some, you know, nothing to, nothing at all to do with the the real work involved in the back end uh, web web back end or, or the um, uh, design of the hardware. So I just just a, 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 a contrib contributor. Uh, but I enjoyed working very much with that. And then um, the the board itself uh, was um, available, and I did <laughs> I did not like the shape of the tracks on the board. <laughs> so, so I thought, well, they were terrible. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix <laughs> so that, I'll fix those up. I like rounded corners, so. I changed all that, <laughs> and then um, uh. there was some move to make it compatible with the Unicart, so we'd have a combined Unicart right. plus cut board. So I put in the the lines to make it compatible, uh, and so that just got you know that was just my small contribution to what was already existing, and then I um, developed the three D printed cartridge shell that is publicly available for that. Uh, nice. So, you know, it's just 
dabbling here and there in bits of the project that I was interested in that I could contribute to, uh, but certainly not my work. Uh, but, but very <laughs> innovative, and uh, I like very much how the homebrew releases have been curated by Pritzak, yes. I think, is doing that. Um, I think that's the name. Uh, right. But uh, it, it creates a great environment for people to uh, be able to check out the latest and greatest without having to uh, spend too much time trying to find things. And... Yeah, it's it's a wonderful resource for people to see games that are in progress and they're and Prizac uh, updates them um, as they come out. And also the people who modify um, existing games because you can break out of a game on the plus cart and go back to the menu, which is just uh, absolutely amazing. And it's really, really great. Mm. And I know the 7800 GD that's coming out has that capability for 7800 games. Um, so that's, that's just a, a really fun um, extra on that cartridge. And uh, everybody that contributes to something makes it better. Uh, no matter even if, if you think your con contributions are small, um, there, nothing is really small in the scheme of things. Everything adds towards um, the end product and making it making it better. I think it's all right to talk about things you work on in other people's projects, but just be clear about where the, the true genius comes from. And so I don't want to That's take right. credit for that or the soccer or the movie cart. I've just been involved in small ways uh, that I've enjoyed. Yeah, that's right. So it uh, we've come to the uh, final uh, thing that we're going to be showing. And uh, maybe you can give us some preamble to it um, before we uh, show it on the screen. And uh, it, and then you can let us know when you want to show it on the screen. Uh, how this came about, why this came about, um, the timeline of the development of it, and the motivation behind wanting to do it. So uh, one of the things we did not look at was when hop. Uh, when hop was a on uh, purpose <laughs> uh, a um, uh, CDFJ, which is ARM based uh, game, which uh, I had uh, started from the uh, Dale Spice's uh, collect demo uh, and incorporated uh, essentially a a, a boulder dash type engine um, in that to create a new game. Uh, uh, and this was about the time that uh, uh, we were talking to BBG about Boulder Dash release, so 2020, something like that. Uh, and I was very interested in seeing how the CDFJ bank, bank switch scheme could be, uh, how I would do things in that scheme relative to other games that I'd already written. Uh, and I... Um, I, I started with a, a, a Boulder Dash uh, implementation and then moved it over to WenHop uh, and constantly refining the systems uh, as I go to make them uh, faster and more capable and putting new technologies in. So I've referenced, you know, interleaved kernel color, uh, for example, and circular swipe and uh, Playfield bitmap draw systems and all of these things are continually updated and refined uh, in my demos. Uh, but um, about uh, two years ago, I started to think, well, you know, we're going to release Boulder Dash, uh, and then what comes after that? Uh, because having played with CDFJ, CDFJ uh, bank switch scheme. There was no way I was going back to the old Boulder Dash code and uh, redoing that. Uh, but uh, it would be nice to be able to release Boulder Dash 2, uh, 3 at some point in the future with new caves. And so I've been secretly working on the new Boulder Dash uh, essentially for two years now, and it's finished. Uh, so uh, the there is no agreement with the IP owner, BBG. They are aware of it, and it may never be released. So don't badger me. Uh, <laughs> the, the point is that um, the one we're releasing now is the Boulder Dash. 
uh, and this one is uh, there's no way I'm going to let it uh, damage uh, sales or interest in the current one. Uh, if this is ever released, this new one, um, it will be a long time in the future and I'm currently considering only selling it. Okay, so there's no agreement to sell it. So it may never happen. But if, right. if the IP right. owners like it and we go through this whole legal process of, you know, uh, lawyers and signing agreements and stuff, it would be my intention to not sell it to anyone who doesn't already own the existing Boulder Dutch. So there you go. Right. Uh, I know <laughs> nobody's going to like that, but really uh, I, I have no... Uh, there's nothing in the pipeline which is anything like an intention to release this with BBG. It's only basically they are aware of it. Uh, this is my own project to uh, see how would we do it for the next Boulder Dash if we did it and incorporating everything I know about CDFJ. Uh, so this right. is really the supreme technology demo uh, of with new caves, uh, all, all, all new caves are designed exclusively for the Atari version. Um, so if I had to guess, I would say that maybe two years down the track, maybe the end of next year, there may be a possibility of releasing it. But as to as to how it would be released, I don't know, because I haven't talked to Atari Age about it. I may very well decide to do a release myself, which is a complete nightmare, uh, because the, the amount... <laughs> You've gone through it. <laughs> the amount of work Albert does uh, for releases is astronomical. So, you know, just yeah. removing labels from cartridges or sourcing new cartridges, sourcing the artwork, getting someone to do the artwork, paying them for it, building the boxes, the, the programming Ooh. the boards, doing the shipping. It's just a lot of work. Uh, so all very much appreciated that as a developer, I can just put it in someone's hands and say, here you go. But I just want to be clear that this is not a official title or release. It's my what if technology demo of if we have a new version. So having said that, feel free. <laughs> disclaimer, disclaimer. <laughs> to, to bring it up. Um, yeah. So, yep. Tanya, I have made some screens for you. Oh, wait, she's got her oh, earpiece out. No, no, I just hit click the button. Oh, it's fine. We haven't yeah. switched it over. Okay. He's saying something okay. to you specifically. No, no, it's okay. Yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> so, Tanya, Tanya I have yeah. made some screens for you, which I have tailored to what I perceive to be your skill level. <laughs> 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 now, that, that, that was not, not an insult, uh, unless you want it to be. Uh, but basically, it's designed to give you uh, smaller screens to play in graduated difficulty. Oh, I see. So okay. There's yeah, also yeah. some videos that James has which are showing how to solve those screens. So I thought maybe we could okay. just watch it play, play it for a little while uh, okay. and uh, see how we go. Okay. <laughs> so here we go. Boulder Dash 2. Let's turn the volume here a little bit. <laughs> so this is using your advanced engine wow. of interlaced, interwoven chronocolor. So uh, interleaved chronocolor. So it's flickering a lot more on my screen than it really does uh, when you're looking at it on a CRT TV. This is one of the uh, characteristics of this new interlayer technology. So you can turn it on or off. So if you try the left difficulty switch, uh, it will just switch back to the original color. Uh, so the idea is that um, if people do not, do not like it, There we go. So um, it's a kind of personal preference thing. Uh, some people will like, uh, I prefer the interleaved kind of color because it gives a very solid color for everything. Uh, yeah. but the feed that's coming through on Twitch made it flicker. 
uh, a lot, which is not what you see with your eyes. Uh, uh, so, um, anyway, both modes are available. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, so someone just said sprite-based text over the interlude background. Wow. Uh, this is something <laughs> that I developed uh, maybe six months ago. It is something I'm very, very proud of. It's never been done before. It's and was that initial thing that you did was that that chess demo yes. of the uh, face going through the chessboard? Yes, and I'd like to say that I, I'm brilliant and like uh, <laughs> uh, you know coming up with this. But actually, the way this happened was I thought I wonder if there's enough cycles to change the um, playfield and the um, sprites at the same time. And so I did some code for it, and um, it, uh, it did not work, and uh, the, the sprites were all messed up. And so I just happened to move some of the code around, and bang, it was perfect. And it was wow. just pure luck, and I have not <laughs> since been able to find any other combination of this. So uh, it's the first time this has been shown on Atari. Wow. It's basically an asymmetric playfield with sprites, a six sprite routine over the top. So as you can see here, it's absolutely brilliant for menu screens because you can have a title screen, full color bitmap playfield with menu over the top. So not only bitmap playfield, animated bitmap playfield. Yeah. Look, so, look at those look at those butterflies flying around underneath the menu. It is uh, absolutely astounding looking it's gorgeous so you don't have any sound running at this point um i can hear it here and it's showing coming through it's probably just a oh, little you know what? i'm not listening to the feed the sound feed so ah, okay. 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 okay yeah 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 yep. it's it's coming through it's all good yeah. so um uh, i expect all my games in future will have a title screen uh full color title screen with menu like this uh, I, I'm oh, yeah. not precious about the code. I will happily share it with other developers if they want to use it. Oh wow, that's amazing. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> so we can expect beautiful title screens from everyone from now on. There's no excuses. Ah, oops. <laughs> Did you change the? Yeah, don't yeah. change no, it from no, NTSC. No, no, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shall we dive into it then? Yes. And take a look. <laughs> go for it. Maybe a bit. Uh, there we go. Unfortunately, it cut out when it was drawing on the screen, but uh, so, uh, so ta bit of, take uh, us through what we're seeing here. So um, there is a little bit of screen issue there with, uh, looks like I've got some scanline issues still. So this is what I call a thumbnail, thumbnail status screen. So uh, you can actually watch the screen being drawn in this uh, section. This is just a, a preview of the whole cave that you are about to play in. Uh, the butterflies and fireflies and sparkles are just eye candy, uh, just, just because I can. <laughs> they are. Uh, but uh, the idea here is that you can, uh, in, in the, the packing of the screens, the, um, I changed the original format slightly and I changed the draw system so that you can uh, watch the uh, unpacking happen. Uh, it's very right. visually very nice uh, and uh, it, it didn't take much extra code. So um, that's really all the screen is. It's just a, a get ready to play uh, and press the button when you're ready to go. Right. But a very nice visual while, while it's displaying what cave you're on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's uh, press the button, go into it. It's Tanya's cavern. <laughs> Woo -hoo -hoo. And that guy has uh, floppy blonde hair. That's Very nice. really uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Tanya's already discovered how so, to uh, switch um, uh, viewing modes. Normally, the top score line will be colored, and the top left there is three diamonds, three more diamonds to collect. Uh, and you've got T31, that's 30 seconds left to do it. Uh, so. You've already figured out how to switch between different resolutions there, I see. So if you press yeah. the button again, Tanya, mm -hmm. just press the button. Yeah. It's 
so zoomed in. Yeah. So that switches back and forth between those two display sizes. If you double click the button, that's okay. So you ran out of time while I was distracting you. But <laughs> there, that's there's okay. the, um, <laughs> so there's three Sorry. resolutions here, and all of them are playable. Yeah. So uh, this is the normal resolution. If you press the button once, this is the mid resolution. If you double click, you get to the high resolution. Uh, mm. So each of those so has different three mixed. different resolution viewings. Each yeah. of those has different use when you're playing because uh, sometimes you need to do things in one or the other to be able to effectively play the game. So your challenge is to get five diamonds in 40, 40 seconds. <laughs> nice. <laughs> not too hard. You no. can do it. No, oh, and by the way, and, I noticed and... the beautiful side scroll, how smooth that is. So it's, Oh, it's unbelievably smooth. Uh, if people are probably noticing a million things at once now because there's so much going on. First thing that's really visible is the parallax scrolling of multiple playfield levels, which is just mind blowing. People are saying, this is insanity. Parallax, what in the world is happening? There's the comments in the chat. Mm -hmm. And that is absolutely true. Tanya, you you need to pay attention to that flashing time on the top right. Uh, oh, that was the yeah, time. The door, okay. was, the door was open, so you just needed to yep. go through the to open door and you would have, yeah. would have finished that screen. So, uh, and look yeah, at the title screen, uh, waving around. Oh my God, it's just gorgeous. So, uh, James, yes, the parallax scrolling can also be turned off with the other difficulty switch. Uh, I figured some people might not like it. Uh -huh. Right. So it, it. it's a, a bit of a shame that the interleave kernel color doesn't come across in the broadcast quite as nice, but I will just say that it uh, effectively triples the resolution of the colors. So instead of seeing those black horizontal lines between colors, everything yeah. becomes very solid at the cost of a slight perception of shimmer. Not so much flicker, right. uh, but when you look at it on a CRT, uh, if it's adjusted properly, it's just gorgeous. Yeah, because the phosphor die-off would would blend the two frames really, really nicely. Uh, it, uh, it, unfortunately, it, with the it, broadcasting, it has asked, "Can you toggle to the interleave view during the game?" And the answer is yes, you can. Uh, it's dynamic, so if James flick the switch, it would go straight to interleave. Sure, and I'm just going to warn people, because we are compressing in real time and it's effectively giving a almost full screen, constant change every every frame, uh, 60 times a second, that uh, is hell on compression. So just a warning, when I flick it back, it's going to be a little, a little much. Uh, but just believe us, it looks gorgeous locally if you play it. So let me flick that back. Start again. I don't know. Oh. Hold it down. Okay, there we go. Okay, go into game. And go right into it. It's it's dynamic. It should happen mid game. Uh, okay. Yeah. So that looks terrible for me. So uh, it does not look like that, uh, but you'll notice the score is now a colored score instead of yeah. uh, just uh, yellow. Um, it, it looks terrible, James. You need to switch. Uh, <laughs> I, I knew it. This so. is one of, the, uh, one of the cases where human perception is important and it's not uh, well across a streaming. Uh, yeah. I'll switch it back. <laughs> well done, Tanya. Sorry? Yeah, okay, good. So this one. Okay, good. so let's talk about some of the, uh, some of the scads of features and things that are going on on the screen that people are seeing. You can go to the big view. 
no the other the zoomed in view there you go so there's uh the diamonds are shining the boulders are wobbly um okay, so i'll put that one in because it doesn't actually change the gameplay but it helps beginners understand what is going to happen to those boulders so which ones are going to fall tanya you've just checked yeah, yourself so. uh you can either wait till the time runs out or you can commit suicide yeah yeah i just okay. hold it down okay. oh it should have been zoomed in for the suicide we'll do that next because yeah. <laughs> that's actually very impressive as well every, every, there's so much attention to detail in this game of of movement mm. animation graphics um just absolutely everything uh ace 3093 says it looks almost like an atari lynx game rc70 this is incredible i can't believe i'm witnessing the premiere of this and uh yeah so much uh love has gone into this game uh and it's uh listed here as couch compliant and and that's one of the features that you can blow yourself up if you get stuck yeah so you you everything that you need to do in the game you can do from the joystick so uh, if Tina gets stuck, she just has to hold the button down for about five seconds and then she will die. Uh, after you're dead, you press the button again and you go back to your next life. Uh, the, everything I've, I've tried to put, well, everything is on the joystick alone and you never need to get up off the couch to play this game. So, <laughs> um, Tanya, next time you die, uh, mm -hmm. don't press the button. Just use the joystick and you can look around the whole screen. Mm -hmm. mm. So that's also a feature as well. Um, just like the original Boulder Dash, you're able to look around the screen by... Um, is it the same thing, holding down the button and moving? Yeah, no, it's a little, a little bit different. In the uh, original Boulder Dash, you hold down the button for a while and it switches into a mode that lets you look around. This one does yeah. that with the different resolutions. So. You press the button ah, to yes. get to mid view and press it again to get to full view. But after you're dead in this one, you can still scroll around and have a look at the whole screen and see why you why you died or where things were. So uh, hold down a button, Tanya. Mm. Hold it Boom. hold it down. Yeah. And the whole screen shakes. Yeah. Which is which is also suicide, amazing. So. Mm. Um, so, so let's go I, through I have some a, of these a list other of things. Uh, yes, I can go exactly. through those. So, uh, essentially, the the really smooth uh, scrolling uh, has been possible, um, rather than the original Boulder Dash, which was character-based graphics, so everything was chunky. Uh, this now, as you can see here, has a pixel pixel smooth, play for pixel smooth scrolling in uh, this mode and in the original uh, normal view. That's actually very interesting for me watching someone else play it because, uh, you know, do do you always play in the mid view or do you always go to the right. normal view? Or and some screens you get benefits from playing in one mode and not the other. So uh, it's just uh, kind of cool watching Tanya decide which one <laughs> to do. Yeah, because it would depend on the level as well. Like yeah. Some levels, it's easier to see it in bigger view. Some, it's fine in the zoomed in view. So and uh, in this one, this, this, is, a... this is the wrong view to be doing it in because it's very hard to tell what you're doing. So With the boulders. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially in this uh, Chronicolor version, it's... Uh, very uh, much harder to see. So in the interleaved kind of mm. color, uh, I would expect most people would be playing that, but for the show. So the super smooth right. scrolling, the smooth player movement. So instead of just clunking into the next square, he walks smoothly between the squares he's in. Um, yes. The magnifications. Uh, the overview mode, the, the, the one where you double click, all of the objects in that are just one pixel wide. Uh, that's a pretty cool thing that uh, wow. managed to get yep. recognizable graphics in one pixel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, everything is viewable in the one so, pixel wide. You can still understand like the flashing is the diamonds, the boulders, your character, even though it's one pixel wide, which is astounding. Yeah. Um, so the um, 
the real time switchable displays, I think, is pretty cool between Crayon yeah. Color and, and uh, ICC. This game has automatic PAL, NTSC, and CCAM detection. So, this is the first ever, as far as I know, fully compliant CCAM game. So, this has been wow. tested on actual hardware. Uh, it brings a whole bunch of uh, of new colors to the CCAM console. I think there's ah. maybe two CCAM people in the whole world, but uh, I thought I'd <laughs> support them anyway. Uh, they're they're going to be so happy <laughs> <laughs> that they have finally have a game that they can play. <laughs> it's a complete waste of time, and it took me weeks, but I feel <laughs> satisfied having, having done it. Uh, so, yeah, the mixing of colors actually brings new... Uh, visuals to the CCAM, it looks nothing like any other CCAM game. But bet, as know. we noted, it's the first game to have that six sprite routine on top of Playfield so for the menu. Uh, so that's that's new. And it has the... So Tanya, Try do not press case. the button. Just oh, scroll around. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'll go back to the menu. And when, when I die, you mean? Yeah. Uh, yeah, after when you I die, die, yeah. die uh, yeah. you can look around. Just scroll right. around and look at the, look at the, yeah. yeah. There we go. Cave C. So uh, I've, I've implemented a, a new format for the cave data. So uh, not using the original, um, original Boulder Dash data structures, but uh, adding to them. So uh, this game now has essentially 120 different caves, uh, which can be wow. significantly different. Uh, so uh, many, many more caves to play. Uh, and there are Easter eggs. So this is just the Tanya version. Uh, the Tanya version only has five levels, <laughs> but the, mm. the full version, which James also has, uh, has much, much more complex caves. Uh, so Tanya, in this one, version. you need to somehow <laughs> block off that amoeba so it turns into diamonds. Mm. Oh, yeah. With the boulder, Ah, right? too late. <laughs> uh, you can still get it. Push Ow. that boulder over. Trap oh, push there. it over? Yeah, the yeah. other way. He's still in there. One more. Oh, no, he's not escaped. Oh, too late. That's okay. All right, that's fine. Blow yourself up and then uh, look around, right? Yeah. So what... I can double click and look around, or you just ran, look around. Ran, ran out of oh, I see. There. Gotcha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. So you can see the whole um, the whole play field mm. um, after you die to kind of see. Oh, and you can even change the resolutions as well after you die too. Mm. Yeah, that's excellent. So, uh, bit of a clue for you, Tanya. You can block off the amoeba yourself. So if you're standing in a gap. There's no gap there, and the amoeba will, will be blocked. So the uh, idea okay. is you're running out of time. Uh, you've only got 60 seconds uh, to do this. And uh, now why is it not counting down? I think it's uh, that's a bug. Yeah. Uh, it just kind of sits yet. there <laughs> for a while. Yeah. Um, so that's the bug. Oh. Uh, I put yeah, these screens just, in there... yesterday, so I no, expect it, it I've uh, the... done some broken something oh, there. Yeah. Uh, we might need to reset on that one. Oh, oh well. Go to the next one. <laughs> or do you want to do the Mebo one? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, we're going to have to completely reset. We're getting into KB2. Oh, no, okay. We're good. C2 still the amoeba mm -hmm. so uh for toko 8 bits yes indeed you did see a very early version of uh this uh maybe a year and a half ago uh at that stage i was just playing with uh seeing how to use uh cdfj but i continued in secret uh yeah, and uh yeah. did an awful lot of uh changes to the system. Is this uh, not coming up, Tanya? It, it seems to wait a long time before it yeah, starts each no, game. It just has about, the title? Let's go on to the next one. Is if, it? If you press okay. press the select, oh, select there we key go. or... Oh, we're going. It does work eventually. <laughs> yeah, okay. it just oh. takes a tiny bit to go. Just a, a timer problem. So 
Right now, the amoeba is blocked because it cannot get out of that square. No. You are blocking the exit, no. but you are also running out of time. And now you've screwed right. yourself. <laughs> oh, I see. Because so you want to block him yeah. on the inside. So if we watch what happens, uh, when it gets blocked, I'm ready. Ah. Change but that's fine. I understand. Yeah. But how are you going to get the diamonds? Because there's right. no that's boulder true. in the way. Uh, yeah. So I thought you had to drop the boulder on the amoeba. Oh, that's what I was thinking. I I, that, I that's see. what you wanted me to do, but um, but it will it'll expand until it, until it breaks. Gotcha. So okay. It just changed into diamonds, but you can't Look at all those get diamonds. them. Yeah. <laughs> so that long wait is bugging me terribly. <laughs> it's like that I have a bug in my software. Uh, uh -oh. Can you Tank. pull pull bol boulders? No, you can only you push can only, them. You can push them. Okay. Yeah. So, <laughs> so James, how about showing Tanya the video solution to this one? Uh, can you yeah. do that? Yeah, we can do that. Let's transition over. Yeah. Let me bring that up. So this is a uh, recording of and that Andrew did for uh, this level that we were just looking at. So uh, this video is a much better indication of how the ICC looks. Uh, because this is coming through nicely on on mm. Twitch. So essentially just yes. a little bit of shake or shimmer, but uh, much more solid looking colors. So here I went inside and I'm blocking off then the exit to a smaller mm. area so that the amoeba right. will turn into diamonds quicker and I won't run out of time. And so- mm. And you cleared the board boulder too. So that you can go back yeah. over and get the diamonds. And so ah. now I have time left. I can just get the required number of diamonds and exit. So, so the whole game is full of puzzles like this. Mm. Is uh, how to um, use your knowledge about the the way to use objects like boulders and diamonds and. Uh, so this next one is butterflies turn into diamonds so how do you drop how do you kill the kill the butterfly uh, so. so you get it when it's coming up that gives you a lot of time to drop the boulder mm. when it's in the right spot yeah so that was an example of a screen where playing in that mid mode is more beneficial because you can see the timing much better mm. right And this is the last one. Guarded exit. Okay, yeah. A whole bunch of baddies, but you, and you can't get next to those baddies, but there's a boulder. You can let them all out. You protect yourself. And there we go. Puts on his shades. He's all cool. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. So I did actually record a half hour long play of playing all that, but we've just gone way over time in our interviews. <laughs> yes, <Yeah>. we have. <laughs> but, uh, oh, just absolutely astounding. Uh, is there any, did we get through all the lists of, of all the things that are in this? Uh, uh, mostly, I think, uh, essentially, yeah. the, the anything and everything I could think of to uh, put in that I could support with the arm stuff I did. And I'm um, pretty much out of ideas uh, and this is <laughs> ready to go and I really want to move on to my next game. So uh, having the show as my introduction to the world of this finished version is probably where it's going to end now. And I expect <laughs> to go and start working on when hop 
uh, because ah. I think Excellent. Wen Hop is pretty funny. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, trying to... You see, the thing is, um, all the refinements and improvements I've made in this game, Boulder Dash, I can now use this as the basis for developing Wen Hop, which will be so much better because it will have the interleave kind of color and it will have all the optimizations and so uh, I'm effectively going to start that one from scratch using this engine oh. but it will uh, have all of those new things in it uh, at the start uh, so green hop is going to be basically a, a a quest to visit the nine planets of the solar system Pluto being one of those uh, and to find the, <laughs> the, the 10th planet, uh, which will be essentially Melon Husk is the protagonist and he's riding his mm. spaceships with the Doge Balls, if you remember that. Uh, I do. The, it's so funny. There's so many funny things in that so, game. So uh, I think uh, I, I got a lot of fun out of the innuendo uh, in that game. Yeah. And... Uh, I think it will lend itself well to a, a nine-stage quest. Uh, so that's my intention at the moment to start working on that one. And I will be able to share binaries of that with everyone in the forums. So uh, that will be my next project. That's really, really exciting, seeing this technology that you've built up over time culminate in this Boulder Dash version, Boulder Dash 2, and Wenhop very soon. And I, and I loved uh, showing off Wenhop when, uh, when we did back then. And uh, I'm really looking forward to that game because it looks so funny and so much fun. And, and you put out some demos of spaceships flying around, multiple spaceships on the same screen as well. Um, I think we played those demos as when they came out on the show. And uh, yeah, there's this technology is, it seems unlimited in what you can do with Playfield and large Playfield sprites. Um, yeah, so once you've is, developed the generic systems, it's not, not hard to use. Uh, I mean, I have a, a drawer function, a draw bitmap function, which will take any bitmap and draw it on the screen. So the text you saw at the start of each level was just bitmaps being drawn. Uh, and so uh, using it in a new game, uh, it's not hardwired to the current game. It's just a generic draw. And so uh, the engine will, uh, all of the things that you saw in this demo will be available without much modification for the next one. Uh, and the, the other thing I'll say is that um, today we did not really see the, the value of the interleaved corona color. Uh, it just does not lend itself to uh, the streaming. The videos yeah, gave a better impression because they were much less flickery. Uh, but yeah. the important thing is, is that it's switchable. So if you don't like it, you just uh, <laughs> flick that switch on the back of your console. Uh, so uh, that's right. That kind of color, interlude kind of color, is not on the earlier demos of Wenhop. So that will be a huge improvement in the visuals of that uh, when I get around to it. So yeah, very exciting. And like RC seventy says, this is huge, right? <laughs> yes, it is huge. This is a a very new technology in way, a new way to display graphics on the 2600 and i can see a lot of people being able to use this because you're going to be sharing this technology with people and this and uh i can't wait for this next round of games and and creative people to to adapt their games or make new games with it very very exciting yeah you know it it hasn't happened a lot that someone's used technology someone else has put out there. We all tend to be isolated and use our own systems. So we shall see. Yep. Uh, but at least it'll be there if people want to. Uh, but I have my doubts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you do have to use the right, uh, the right graphics for the right game. And 
somebody might see this and go, oh, now I can make the game I've always wanted to make, but I haven't had the tools. And this might supply them the tools to make it. And, and hopefully we'll see some, some great stuff come out of it. So thank you so much, Andrew. <laughs> Four, four, four hours and 20 minutes, James. Yeah. <laughs> is, that a, wow. is that a record? Cool. It's it's getting there. I, yeah. I think you For a and, single you and, show and not a marathon show, yeah, it's pretty high You and high John Shampo yeah. <laughs> are, are neck and neck for, for, yeah. for um, long um, uh, we still developer have spotlights. We still have 20 viewers, so thank you, everyone, for sticking with yeah. it. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> thank honor. you staying up on a, a late night on a Friday yeah. slash Saturday, Friday. depending, yeah. depending uh, where you live. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, yeah thank you so much andrew yeah. um for for coming on the show um it's it's taken a couple years to get you on <laughs> but uh it, it's well worth the wait and um thank you for showing off all this amazing stuff you've been working on and going through your history and learning more about you and it's it's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. My grandkids will look back on this show in the future and learn all about me. Uh, I'd just <laughs> like to to say that um, on behalf of the community, what uh, how valuable I think uh, Zero Pages, uh, and I would like to see you guys continue for years to come as well. Because uh, although we're a small community, I think uh, uh, efforts like all together and give us a central place to come together and share our, our excitement. So as a developer, being able to see my stuff on the show and then later on YouTube is a, a huge buzz. Uh, and so I appreciate it very much. Oh, no problem. We love doing it. It's so much fun doing the show, playing all these amazing games, be able to share them with the community. It's 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 a privilege mm -hmm. and an honor to to show off your games and everybody else's in the community. It's uh, it's it's really fun and mm -hmm. we've done it for five uh, years. Now? Five years yeah. in, in a in a couple of days we'll yeah. we'll have done it for five years and we're looking forward to five more. years more. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> or even more than that. So thank you so much for yeah. your uh, your uh, praise of the show. It's it's All right. So it's uh, great. I've enjoyed today. Thank you and uh, goodbye to everyone out yeah. there. Have and, a good uh, night, uh, yeah, or morning. <laughs> see you guys yes. next time. Yeah. Yep, and we'll see you in the forums. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye, Andrew. Bye. Have a great Saturday. Well, thank you so much uh, to Andrew for um, showing off all this stuff mm. and for uh, putting up with us for a couple hours <laughs> while we play through his history. <laughs> and I mean, when we have people on the Meryl, show. Meryl, 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 Marco Johanna is holding you, on right to the right end. To, the end <laughs> to not interrupt. Yes. People are very, like like we said in the chat, people were are very respectful in the community. Yes. And yeah. it really shows on, yeah. the, on the show where they don't feed the cats. Yeah. <laughs> They don't yeah. interrupt because they know yeah. it says stuff, and yeah. and you know that that shows all the time. They they do that all. You guys do that all the time, and it's really really nice. Mm. And we don't ask you to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was crazy. Yeah. It, it was really really great. Um, and I love doing these developer spotlights. They're a lot of work because I have to do a lot of research mm -hmm. and coordinate with the Look developer. Look up a lot, a lot of stuff. Make sure. So I. I tend to limit them to a couple times a year mm -hmm. uh, maybe three or four or five um, but you get to learn a lot about the person and you get to directly talk with them for an extended period of time which is nice yeah. which is great because other other than this we get to meet them at prge maybe mm -hmm. yeah and, maybe yeah and that's about the only interact interaction we have <laughs> with them and them with us too mm -hmm. because you guys see us but it's so much fun talking yeah. directly with the person, especially going through these history of these prolific, yeah. amazing programmers. And we've had so many of them on the show mm. and it's just a big honor. Um, the next one we'll be doing, I don't know when, it's not scheduled. Okay, in the future. It's far in the future, mm. um, well after our break. Uh, it'll be uh, Chris Walton. Oh, CD nice. CD-W. Yes, nice, okay. And uh, maybe we'll uh, debut Xevious. His oh, final version of CBS. Maybe something Excellent. else. Yeah, yeah. That'd be, wonderful. That'd be great. Um, but thank you, everybody, for tuning in. That's the show. Um, the next show is going to be another special show. It's going to be our another special show. First Lynx show. Lynx. Atari oh, Lynx. Oh, oh, oh. that's going to be a good one. We've got a modded Lynx 
Um, That's going to be a good one. Console. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a handheld, but we've made it into a console. Uh, Igor did. And I'll tell you more about that on the show. But that's mm -hmm. on Tuesday after the weekend. And then it's all Atari Homebrew Award Ooh. stuff. After that, the show on next Friday. Is it next Friday? No, I think it's a little bit later. Um, let's take a look at the schedule. I think we've already... Oh, excuse me. Unboxed every new release on Atari Age. We did. We did that on Atari Day, we RC70. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have to look back for that yeah, video. Just rewind it. It was a long show. It was, oh, it was. It's over two days. It was fun, fun, fun. How long fun. was it? It was like 10 hours. We did 12, get them a little hours. early. Yes, we did. Yes. Yeah. We got them um, just after um, we PRG went to PRGE. Yeah. 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 Um, so the, yeah, the Atari Lynx special, yeah, it is next Friday, mm. right? Yep. Uh, the last day of the month. Um, and then the Tuesday after, is it? Let's see, the third, no, the Friday after. Mm. Yeah, it's the next normal show. Uh, is the nominee reveal. Ooh. Of the fifth annual Atari Homebrew Awards, we'll know all the top six games that go on to the uh, voting, the public voting, and that's when you get to vote. That day yeah. is on that Friday, and, and then we play through every single nominated Yay. game leading up to the Atari Homebrew Awards. Yeah. So we get to play all the great games that were released in 2022, and you guys get mm -hmm. to see them and vote on them. Um, yeah, if you missed that uh, Atari Age Day. Um, that was, where was it? There, it was uh, November 12th and 13th. <laughs> Very long, so yeah. strap in. <laughs> and we talked with every single developer of those released games. Oh, um, nice, yeah, yeah. So um, they just went on sale on the store like we talked about at the top of the show. So um, you can go look at our playthrough of them and decide which ones you like and uh, drop a whole bunch of cash. Send it over to Al. Um, a month after the fifth annual Atari Homebrew Awards is the Atari Homebrew High Score Contest. Yes. Yes. Dan, yes. Dan uh, bases the High Score Contest on the winners. Nice. And so there you go. You get to uh, compete against everybody else. RC70 bought Gorf and Vroom. Great. Good job. <laughs> great picks. Yes. Gorf is fun. Vroom yes. is a great eight player game. You can play it just by yourself, too. Mm -hmm. um, but our uh, fifth annual Atari Homebrew Awards live presentation, the big show of the year, is on February 25th. That's a Saturday mm -hmm. at noon. It should be very nice for just about every time zone Australia, Europe, North America. It's all pretty good. A little, early, little early in the morning for Australia, but still not too it's bad. Still, it's still doable. <laughs> yeah, still doable. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it's in the evening for Europe, but everybody can watch. Very nice. Um, so thank you for tuning in for this very special mm -hmm. show with Andrew Davey, uh, RC70, Dan AVC, Atari 2600 Dude, uh, Sin Eater, D Train, Marco Johannes, 8 Bit Poet, Vitoko, uh, Nostalgic. Ace 3093, mm. Daryl 1970, uh, Spiceware. Oh, he went to bed. You <laughs> <laughs> can hear his name later. Yep. Um, Al the Fur. Oh, yep, yeah, that one. Well, it's people jumping in and out. Yeah. It was hard because we were trying to read all the chat on the tiny screen <laughs> over there. and. Yeah. yeah, and Ivory Tower Collections Excellent. at the top there. And Woo. thank you all for your questions. Hey, it took um, too. For Andrew Davey as well. That mm -hmm. was very great. Um, so we will uh, be back on Tuesday with the Link special. Oh, I'm excited. Oh, me too. I am very excited about that. Something brand new. Yeah. Get to play a whole bunch of fun games. I know. Games. I'm super excited. I, I think it's going to be awesome. So. Um, so everybody have a great weekend. Yes. And, Enjoy uh, yourself. Yep. Relax. Have a glass of wine. <laughs> do yes. the 420 thing, as RC70 keeps referring to. <laughs> yeah. Four hours and 20 minutes to show us. <laughs> four hours and Whatever 20 minutes. Is. I don't know what you're I... talking about. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'll go check my clock after the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we will see you on Tuesday. Have yes. a great weekend, everyone. Bye-bye. Yes, bye.